Mesdames et messieurs, chers actionnaires, Ladies and gentlemen, and dear shareholders, we are really happy to welcome you again to this very major event, event our annual general meeting. In the very unprecedented and exceptional context that we are all living in today, it was unfortunately impossible once again this year to have everyone gathered together in the same place for our annual general meeting. In order to respect the legal restrictions that limit gatherings and also to protect the health of everyone concerned, we therefore decided to hold our AGM behind closed, closed doors while streaming the proceedings live on our website. The, as the AGM must fulfill its function to answer, as an opportunity to answer your questions, however, we imperatively needed to still set aside some time for exchanges with you. Thus, in addition to the written question mechanism required by law, a dedicated space was sent, set up on our website on the 19th of April, and you have had the possibility to send us in your questions either in writing or orally by video. You can actually continue to send us your questions live during the AGM. I will therefore be moderating this AGM together with Mr. Luca De Meo, who is a CEO, Mrs. Clotilde Delbos, Deputy CEO and Group CFO, and Mrs. Kitri de Pelper, the Group's Chief Legal Officer. It is also a great pleasure to have with us the members of the Board of Directors, some of whom, of course, are joining us by video conference as they were unable to travel. We also have the members of the group's executive committee and the, our statutory auditors, as well as the two shareholder representatives who will act as scrutineers. I would also like to inform you that a bailiff is present. And now I'd like to give you some legal information concerning the holding of this meeting. Let me remind you that the not notice of this meeting was published in the Bulletin des Annonces Légales Obligatoires and in the Legal Gazette called Les Petites Affiches on 26 March 2021. Uh, registered shareholders, FCPE unit holders, and the statutory auditors were notified either by a post or by email. Now, let me uh, come to the com composition of the bureau of the meeting. In my capacity as chairman of the board of directors, I will be chairing this meeting. The functions of scrutineer will be held by the French state, represented by Mr. Pierre Janin and the company Amundi, represented by Mrs. Corinne Ferrier. And the function of secretary of the AGM will be fulfilled by Mrs. Kitri de Pelport. The bureau is therefore constituted. All the legal documents necessary have been deposited on the desk in accordance with legal provisions and were made available to shareholders as from the convening of the meeting onwards. These documents are recognized as being in order by the Bureau. The notice of meeting, including the agenda and the texts of the resolutions, as well as all required documentation for this meeting, have been made available on the company's website. This year, you were all asked to vote remotely only, and voting closed yesterday at 3 p.m. The results of the votes will be presented to you at the end of the question and answer session. Consequently, I can now inform you of the quorum, which is 60.71 percent of the shares that are entitled to vote, or with voting rights. The required quorum is thus achieved, and the meeting can therefore pr proceed legally. In a few minutes, I shall give the floor to Clotilde Delbos, and she will make a presentation of the group's financial results. But before I do that, I would really like to share with you my analytical presentation of our context. Last year, you may remember, I spoke at length about the circumstances of the pandemic and, the, and Renault's savings plan, which illustrated the difficult times that we were going through. I could obviously talk about these subjects once again this year, because the health crisis is far from being over, and the savings plan that we decided on has not just been implemented, but it is being stepped up. But above all, I would today like to mention the tremendous new dynamic that I see within the, this company. This dynamic is based on the company's collective strength, which is evident at all levels, within the group's teams, within management bodies and the board of directors. And actually, in this respect, the osmosis that exists between the board and the management has, in my opinion, become truly exceptional. It also finds its expression within the alliance. 
This is why I would really like to thank all of the women and the men who embody the strength and give us such great confidence in the future of the group. I could never have imagined when I first joined the company that the group would begin to pull itself together in just two years' time because the ambience in this wonderful company was so deeply damaged and fraught with tension. Uh, Renault definitely has a special talent for performing in times of crisis. Today, the atmosphere is calmer. We are back on the road to serenity, which makes us stronger and enables us to better tackle a situation which is obviously still complicated by the global economic context, by the health crisis in certain regions of the world where the group is particularly strong. The reorganization of the group proposed and carried out by the general management in a remarkably short time is already showing the first indications of its effectiveness. It's made us more agile, and not just commercially either. It has helped us to much better weather headwinds, such as the, the global semiconductor supply crisis or the rise in raw material prices. As you can see, we are optimistic and we are focused on this turnaround. We have regained our confidence, not simply because our efforts are beginning to reap modest rewards, but also because this momentum has clearly increased. Last year, I had the pleasure of introducing our new managing director, Luca De Meo. Luca, with his strength and his determination, has taken over all the operational functions of the group, and this has not escaped anyone's notice. In a very short space of time, he's been able to assert his leadership, speak to the heart of Renault's teams, and strengthen trust with all the group's governance bodies. The Renolution Plan, which Luca will be uh, presenting to you, is our weapon of mass construction and of mass attraction as well. Luca will present our corporate social responsibility or our ESG policy, which combines social, environmental, and economic performance. It is a hugely robust policy. As you will see, Renault now has a demanding and ambitious roadmap that is commensurate with the leadership that our com company must be able to exercise in its business seg segment and beyond. In this regard, I am delighted that the Renault Group has recently been included in the CAC 40 ESG, a new index launched la last March, which brings together 40 companies that have demonstrated their best practices uh, in in, from an environmental, social, and governance point of view. Once you've heard about the CSR or ESG strategy, I shall, for my part, present our raison d'être or corporate purpose, from which all of the group's major orientations naturally flow. But I shall, for the time being, let uh, give the floor to dep our deputy CEO, Clotilde Delbos, whose unwavering commitment helped to maintain Renault's cohesion in the difficult period we went through in 2019 and 2020, and she helped to facilitate the transition once Luca de Meo arrived. Clotilde will be presenting the group's financial results for 2020, which, despite the starkness of the figures, reflect the efforts that all of the group's employees and managers have made and demonstrate our potential to spring back, which certainly augurs very well for the future. Bonjour, mesdames. Bonjour, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me run you through the commercial and financial results for the year 2020, and then we'll briefly examine revenue figures for the first quarter of 2021. As Jean-Dominique has just recalled, the year 2020 was marked by the global pandemic. Quite obviously, this crisis strongly affected all the markets where we are present. Let's uh, take a closer look at uh, just how the company performed in 2020. First, our sales performance. In 2020, the sales volumes were almost 3 million vehicles, down 21.3%, while the market as a whole was down 14.4%. Sales fell sharply in all regions except Eurasia, where they were just about stable, driven in particular by the good performance of the Turkish market. In H2, the decline of registrations was only 6.8%. We benefited from the successful launch of our first hybrid vehicles, 
Clio HEV and Capture BHEV, and from Zoe, which remained the best-selling electric vehicle in Europe. The success of our electric range enabled us to achieve our CAFE targets in 2020. Now let's turn to our financial performance. 2020 was severely impacted by the COVID crisis. Sales came to 43.5 billion euros, down 21.7% for the year, and 8.9% for H2. Let's now look at the contribution of the group's four business segments. Sales for the automotive division, excluding Autobus, came to 37.7 billion euros, down 23%. This is mostly due to the drop in volumes, resulting primarily from falling markets and, to a lesser extent, from our new commercial policy geared towards profitability rather than volumes. Aftervas contributed 2.6 billion euros to group revenue, down 17.5%, largely due to the fall of the ruble. And revenue from our financial branch, RCI Bank, was down 7.8% to 3.1 billion euros. Finally, the new mobility services segment created in 2020 generated 19 million euros in revenue. The group's operating margin was negative at minus 337 million euros, down almost 3 billion euros, which works out to a consolidated operating margin of minus 0.8%. However, the margin, the margin rebounded in H2 and was positive at plus 3.5%, almost stable compared to the same period in 2019. In fiscal 2020, automotive operating margin, excluding Aftervas, was down 2.7 billion euros to minus 1.45 billion, or minus 3.8% against plus 2.6% in 2019. This is mainly explained by lower volumes and to a lesser extent by a negative forex effect on our main currencies. However, our cost control policies as part of our plan 2 to 22 enabled us to cut fixed cash costs by 1.2 billion euros in 2020, which had a positive effect on our performance and made it possible to contain the degradation of our operating margin. After Vaz's contribution to the operating result was 141 million euros, compared to 155 million euros in 2019. RCI Bank once again showed its resilience, contributing 1 billion euros to the group's results. Finally, the contribution of mobility services was minus 35 million euros. The contribution of associated companies to the group's results was minus 5.1 billion euros in 2020, down 5 billion euros. This decrease was mainly due to Nissan's negative contribution of minus 5 billion euros. The contribution of other associated companies was minus 175 million euros. Other operating income and expenses came to minus 1.7 billion euros compared to minus 557 million euros in 2019. This change is mainly due to the sharp increase in restructuring costs as well as to asset write-downs related in particular to the discontinuation of certain programs under our strategic plan, Revolution. The tax charge was 420 million euros compared to 1.5 billion euros in 2019, of which 753 million euros were related to the non-recognition of deferred tax assets on tax losses in France. In total, the group's net income came to minus 8 billion euros compared to plus 19 million euros in 2019. Automotive uh, operating free cash flow came to minus 4.6 billion euros under the combined effect of degraded operating margin and working capital requirement, as well as the lack of dividend from RCI following decisions of the European Central Bank. At the close, the fiscal year 2020, the group posted a net liquidity position of minus 3.6 billion euros, down minus 5.3 billion euros over one year. But 
Automotive liquidity reserves remain high since at end December 2020 they stood at 16.4 billion euros against 15.8 billion euros earlier. earlier. This figure at end, at end 2020 does include the 4 billion euro state guaranteed loan. Due to the current situation of the group, the Renault Board of Directors has decided not to propose the distribution of dividends to the, day, to the AGM. Now, let's move to the year 2021. In Q1, the group's total sales were up 1.1% to 665,000 units, driven by the performance of the Renault brand up 1.3% to 434,000 units, and by Dacia, whose sales were up 10.2% over the period to 121,000 vehicles. Sales of Lada remained virtually stable at 90,000 units. Group sales for the first quarter were down 1.1% to 10 billion euros. At a comparable exchange rates, it would have been up 4.4%. These figures conclude my presentation. I will now hand the floor over to Mr. Wallaert, who will present the statutory auditor's report. Thank you for your attention. Mesdames et messieurs, bonjour. Good afternoon, Au nom du collègue. On behalf of the statutory auditors, I will now present a summary of the report intended for shareholders. These reports uh, have been made available to you and are reproduced in full in the Notice of Meeting brochure. For the 2020 financial year, we issued five reports which relate to the annual accounts, consolidated accounts, remuneration of redeemable shares, related party agreements, and finally one report on an operation relating to the share capital. Our reports on the accounts were drawn up in the complex and fluid conditions of the global crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, which created unique challenges for preparing and auditing the accounts of 2020. In our first report, we unreservedly certify the annual accounts for the financial year 2020. In addition, in accordance with regulations, the key points of the audit of the Renault Group are developed in our opinion reports. Regarding the annual accounts, the key point is the valuation of redeemable shares and related receivables. We also unreservedly certify the 2020 consolidated financial statements of Group Renault. The three key points of the audit for of the consolidated accounts are as follows. First, the recoverable amount of assets in the automotive sectors. Second, the accounting method and the recoverable amount of Renault's investment in Nissan. And third, the calculation of expected losses on sales financing receivables. For each of these points, we reviewed the accounting methods applied, and we ensured that the estimates made by Renault were reasonable. In connection with the ordinary AGM, we issued two other reports. The first report concerns redeemable shares. We certify that the elements for calculating the variable compensation of these securities comply with the terms of the issue contract. We also confirm the figures taken from the company's consolidated financial statements. The second report concerns related party agreements. It describes the main terms and conditions of the agreements of which we were notified between your company and its uh, corporate offices or between your company and companies with common directors. 
we have not been notified of any such agreement authorized by your board of directors during the past financial year needed to be submitted uh, for your approval at this uh, general meeting. The agreements already approved by your general meeting and whose execution continued, continued during the 2020 financial year are recalled in our report. Finally, in respect of the extraordinary part of the AGM, we've issued a special report concerning a resolution likely to affect your share capital. These transactions are subject to the conditions provided for by the Commercial Code. Our report does not contain any particular remarks or observations to bring to your attention. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Valert, for this very clear presentation. We'll now move on to the uh, strategic part of this presentation. I'll give the floor to Luca Di Meo, who will uh, introduce Renolution, uh, the outlook, and then, of course, the group's uh, policies. Bonjour à tous. L'année passée. All right. Well, uh, after a year, well, almost a year in office, I had. It is my privilege to uh, speak before you, and on this occasion, I would like to say how delighted I was to be able to take over 20 years after I started in this very company. I was delighted to be back with you. Of course, I would have preferred uh, for conditions to be more favorable, but, uh, well, in the heart of a storm, uh, I think we should speak words of confidence. After 10 months uh, back in the company, I was able to assess both the company's strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we are being challenged, and, uh, of course, our performance, as uh, Clotilde pointed out, showed that we did, we were indeed um, hit by the crisis nonetheless. We have everything it takes to bounce back. Uh, in January, on 14 January, we uh, announced our new uh, strategic plan entitled Renolution, which includes three uh, stages, uh, resurrection, renovation, and revolution. And this, uh, well, all three stages are, are starting simultaneously, but they, they will take uh, their full effects in turn. I would like to uh, revisit these, uh, these announcements, but also give you a progress report over the past three months. So resolution, re resurrection is in full swing. Uh, well, resur resurrection means <laughs> return to profitability and return to cash generation uh, via uh, cost reduction and, of course, a, uh, a better hold of um, revenue. Of course, instead of looking for volumes, we're now turning to uh, value. Uh, value creation and, uh, well, of course, we uh, started on this as early as last summer and uh, progress is already visible and we can see the first results are visible uh, already. We, can, we have the numbers for January, but nonetheless, the, uh, over the past few months, there were challenges. Uh, upstream, of course, the uh, uh, increased prices in the cost of raw materials will make a, 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 a will weigh on, the, on production costs on manufacturing costs in our plants. The shortage of semiconductors uh, will probably mean 100,000 uh, cars less. Uh, in our dealerships, our orders are still being hampered uh, by the sanitary restrictions. And every day, we're trying to do uh, everything we can to uh, to fight back and 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 uh, and resist resist. But um, uh, even though these are uh, headwinds, sig significant headwinds, our efforts are bearing fruit. Regarding fixed costs, we can stick to our commitment to achieve as much as 2 billion euros in savings. And in fact, we will be able to achieve this ahead of schedule. Uh, we will be able to do this uh, by uh, year's end 2021 instead of 2022. And indeed, we propose to do more than that in years to come. Regarding va variable costs, 
months now. In a matter of three months, we were able to achieve one third uh, of uh, the um, course we had set for 2023. Nonetheless, uh, we, as I said, we are, we are facing a significantly higher increase in the cost of uh, in price of raw materials. Uh, this is much more than than anticipated, and so we have resorted to a an emerge and a contingency plan to address this regarding engineering uh, and the product range. Well, of course, we decided to streamline this, and indeed, as many as seven programs uh, were suspended, but eight new programs. Uh, were created. We created families, making it possible to reduce uh, parts diversity by as much as 25 percent on all models. We are also stepping up uh, development time. Uh, in a matter of nine months, we were able to um, uh, validate the design and structure and the cost structure of as many as nine new uh, projects. And for launches, the development lead time will be reduced by one year. And and the um, entry ticket will be down 40 percent. So as announced, we have started streamlining our um, uh, uh, engine uh, uh, production. And it's fairly simple. Instead of having eight uh, families of engine, we only have four. And that covers as many, twice as many uh, models per engine uh, and covering also a wider range of power. Now, uh, streamlining is already underway, and that's indeed being optimized because the only diesel engine, uh, engine used uh, for um, LCVs uh, will be dedicated to existing models rather than new, uh, uh, new models. On the manufacturing side, we are making our plants more and more competitive in the harbor uh, ranking that compares the effectiveness of uh, manufacturing sites in number of uh, cars, uh, hours per car. We have as many as four plants of our group amongst the, uh, the top 10 in the world. And of course, we are looking uh, for excellence by 2025, and we want our um, uh, filling ratios to be as much as 90 percent, that is, our use uh, our occupancy ratio to be as high as 90 percent. Of course, uh, our agreement with Mitsubishi in Europe will make a difference because, uh, because we manufacture cars for them. That will mean we will be uh, uh, using capacity to a higher extent. Regarding inventory, inventories will be down 26 percent in Q1, from 660,000 cars down to 480,000. So well, a lot remains to be done, however, of course, to um, uh, stabilize well inventory levels. Uh, we want to uh, stabilize that at 60 days. But um, in the various markets where we work, we are adjusting our uh, business by optimizing our uh, uh, distribution uh, uh, channels. And in Korea, for instance, we announced our competitiveness uh, program in January 2021 to uh, improve domestic sales, but also become a, a base of um, a, 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 an exports base, a competitive exports base. That's uh, Korea. But in Australia and South Africa, we are also reducing fixed costs while maintaining our sales activity, but this uh, working, uh, working with an importer. And so we are restoring uh, the uh, the foundations of performance, and we're preparing the, preparing the future, and that's renovation. Uh, so over and beyond the reduction of costs, we are also working on generating new revenue. Um, so of course, we had to reprice our vehicles, and indeed, uh, uh, in H2 2020, we already improved our price performance by more than six percentage points compared to H2 uh, 2019. Well, this trend is being confirmed in the first quarter of this year, where, again, we were able to improve our price performance by as many as six points compared to the first quarter of 2020. But also, we had this, we decided to uh, revisit our sales channels. And so instead of pushing volumes, we are looking for value per car. And so as early as 2020, we uh, decided to emphasize sales on uh, to individuals, uh, especially with our Renault and Dacia brands, with as many as 54 percent of our sales going through that channel. Uh, so that's more 9 percent more than in 2019. So headway is being made there, and in Europe, our leadership on uh, 
the uh, well, electric cars, or uh, that, as Clotilde was saying, this leadership is being confirmed. And in the first quarter for the Renault brand, uh, one uh, private car in four now being sold is an electric car. In France, uh, Renault is the leader on hybrids and electric cars ahead of Toyota. And indeed, it is a leader on electric cars ahead of Pe Peugeot and Tesla. And in March, our Clio was number one on the hybrid market ahead of uh, the Toyota Yaris, the Dacia Spring. Uh, is beyond expectations. Uh, we have a very high level of pre-orders in a matter of three weeks. At group level, the electrified mix in Europe almost doubled from 7% uh, in Q1 2020 to 13% uh, in Q1 of 2021. Uh, reconquering segment C, of course, the C segment was uh, uh, our major strategy, and the first steps were made with the launch of Arcana last month. And that's already been elected SUV of the year by Automoto magazine uh, worldwide. We have uh, had many successful launches. And I'll set just a few examples. In Russia, the Lada Neva, uh, in its two versions, uh, have made a hit on the market with as many as 6,000 uh, uh, units sold in a matter of weeks. In Brazil, uh, with the success of Sendero, Duster, and Quid, Renault improved uh, profitability by uh, adjusting its price policy, repricing uh, its cars uh, up four points compared to the market. In India, Kaiga. Uh, has recorded as many as 12,000 orders since the end of January. For uh, this, for Q1, as Clotilde pointed out, uh, all these efforts made it possible for us to address a very challenging context. Um, in spite of the uh, restrictions, on a like-for-like -like basis, revenue would have been up 4.4 percent, in particular because of our repricing position uh, uh, policy. So we are redressing the balance, and uh, um, now we're turning into a tech company, uh, drawing revenue from uh, power, data, and services, and that is revolution. The uh, new uh, product line will be driven by the poles of excellence and innovation that we are building as we speak. And so instead of being a car-making company integrating technology, we'll become a tech company integrating vehicles. The first pole of excellence is, of course, the energy transition. Right now, we are leaders, and we certainly intend to remain leaders in the energy transition. Over and beyond the electrification, we are now investing in hydrogen. With plug power, now that's a unique example of uh, cooperation, uh, which uh, will develop state-of-the-art uh, activities and R&D to uh, manufacture and design um, fuel cells made in France. That's the first pull of excellence. But the second one is the Software Republique, which we've just launched. And what we propose to do there is uh, to build about, uh, to bring about in France and indeed in Europe, the uh, technology building blocks uh, which will uh, drive mobility tomorrow. So we have five founding matters Atos, Dassault System, uh, ST Micro, Microelectronics, and Thales, plus ourselves, of course. And together we will propose solutions that will bring together cybersecurity. 5G, cloud, and uh, connected vehicles. Let's take a look at these uh, fine projects. Our plug power partnership and indeed uh, the uh, inception of Software Republic. Let's take a look at this. Building the Renault Group's competitiveness and that also involves big projects. We're all familiar with the Renault Group's experience in renewable energy and its strong position in the electric light utility vehicle market. Today, the group's pioneering approach is joining forces with plug power's 20 years of experience in fuel cell technologies and hydrogen-based solutions. This union is a 50-50 joint venture that will be established in France by mid-2021 with the goal of gaining over 30% of the market share in hydrogen-powered light utility vehicles in Europe. Research, transformation, manufacturing, selling hydrogen vehicles, creating charging stations, delivering carbon-free hydrogen and associated services. With the new strength this joint venture embodies, the group intends to position France as a leader in the industrial, technical and commercial development of this key technology, hydrogen. 
France and Europe must ensure their sovereignty by building a new technological sector for mobility. With Atos, Dassault Systems, ST Microelectronics and Thales, Rono has created Software Republic, a made-in-Europe ecosystem to provide turnkey technological solutions for shared, smooth and low-carbon mobility. The five companies are mobilizing 2,000 engineers and developers for major projects in mobility, artificial intelligence, big data, cybersecurity, and infotainment systems. This new ecosystem is poised to develop totally new tech solutions to help solve the challenges of gridlock, isolation, and electric charging for communities, companies, and individuals. This is how Software Republic will participate in the Renault Group's transformation from an automaker that incorporates tech to a tech company that incorporates automobiles. The revolution is underway. Now, our third uh, pole of excellence or hub or cluster of excellence is the refactory in Flint. We are actually taking over leadership on the circular economy market, and I'll tell you more details about that in a little while when I uh, start talking to you about our new strategy for societal and, and environmental strategy. The transformation that all of these clusters and hubs are going to uh, bring to us will be concretized in the short term and the medium. Term. The Megane E, which is going to be out in uh, the streets at the early uh, early next year, is going to be the first embodiment of this. It's going to be manufactured in within the North Electric Pole, and it's going to be in embodying the excellence and the leadership of the group in the EVs made in France on an alliance platform that is completely dedicated to electric cars. It's going to completely break with the codes of with the cues of size, design, and use of vehicles that are based on a classic platform. It's going to be connected and will be in, uh, equipped with MyLink, our system of information and media uh, that also includes uh, Google Automotive Services. It will know where, what trips you take. It will adapt to your needs and will propose services that are dedicated to electric driving, for example, like the indication of, a term, of a, um, charging terminals. Sorry. To conclude, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we are carrying out this revolution at every level of the company and everywhere in the world because we are going and getting from every single function the least lever of performance for our resurrection in while we do this we are we keep we are keeping our course for uh, generating revenue and profits while putting our priority on the revolution range to come we're going to have innovative vehicles that will be enriched with a lot of content and at the very technological edge of what our group can design develop and produce in this effort we are making to come back to profitability profitability and to generate cash we actually have to do more with less it is also obviously about doing things better than before. This, that, and that is uh, what gives meaning to our new environmental and societal strategy. We uh, we decided to revise it uh, based on what we ha already had, and to add to give ourselves a much wider and more collective ambition that could really be shared within the company and with the board. First of all, um, CSR or, or our ESG is going to become a lever for performance. Up to now, it was very much present, but sometimes it was d uh, dissociated from uh, operational work. We have now uh, integrated it into Renolution, and it's going to be one of the chapters of Renolution. As I told you, we've revised the strategy, and we've made it much more Renault-ish. We've kept its historic values of innovation and solidarity, which are very much like us and which are very much like uh, like the DNA of Renault and like the corporate purpose of Renault that Jean-Dominique will talk to you about in a little while. We have deci we, uh, decided to look for meaning, a double meaning, social and economic. We also decided to stay pragmatic, to be concrete with our plans and our actions. So every commitment is designed with one with an indicator and with objectives for 2025 and 2030. 
So there's going to be three pillars on which our action will be structured. The first pillar is a reduction of our carbon footprint and an optimized use of uh, the resources that we have to the benefit of the environment and also to uh, the benefit of our economic performance. The second pillar, pillar is the safety of our customers on the roads and the safety of our employees in their workplace. And lastly, inclusion. We are switching to electrification, to data, to cyber safety, security, by at the same time accompanying the transformation of our skills and by prom promoting diversity within the group. These three pillars actually support and carry the transformation that is going to be operated by Renolution and will make us into a, a, a greener, more tech company that is turned towards data, energy, and services. In English, we can call this being a car maker and care makers. We are going to make cars while at the same time taking care to ensure that those who design them and manufacture them, the people who use them, and the planet that uh, is serves uh, for us to produce them should also be taken care of. Let's start with the environment. We are cutting down on our end-to-end -end emissions, both for ma materials and components that we buy, our plants, the emissions of our vehicles when they're being used during their second life, as well as recycling. So this reduction throughout the entire life cycle of our cars makes it possible for us to aim to be carbon neutral in Europe by 2040 and to be carbon neutral worldwide in 2050. Of course, all car makers are committing themselves to these horizons, and we are not an exception because obviously it takes a long time to go to carry out the energy transition. But we, on our part, are also taking commitments for the shorter term. And we are even more legitimate to do so because we have, uh, we, we are actually a step ahead. We are a real pioneer in the circular economy of mobility, and we also have our clear leadership uh, in electric vehicles in Europe. These are all, all points of excellence, and we plan to use them and use them as pillars for our roadmaps towards decarbonization and our levers of competitiveness. First of all, uh, we are going to look at upstream decarbonization, that of the components and the substances, uh, materials that we buy. Today, six materi uh, materials and components uh, represent 90 percent of the carbon uh, uh, footprint of our purchasing. That is steel, aluminum, polymers, electronic components, tires, and glass. We are going to start with these components, and by 2030, our ambition is to reduce the 30, reduce the carbon footprint linked to our purchases of these materials by 30 percent. This obviously can only be done through a common and joint in commitment with our main uh, supplier partners, and this also means, and we are the very first car makers to do this is we are going to set up an internal tariff for carbon. In con concrete terms, each supplier uh, uh, coat will be matched with a carbon foot, uh, footprint, and we will progressively apply an extra cost, which will go from 50 euros per ton uh, from now to 2025 up to 100 euros per ton up to 2030, by 2030. So in a very pragmatic manner, this tool is going to make it possible for us to better pilot our purchases and to ensure that we can carry our supplies with us. We also want to open up this, the path to a green, decarbonized and responsible battery. From 2025, with the launch of the new R5, our battery will have a reduction of its carbon imprint by 20 percent, because it's going to be assembled in France with a strongly decarbonized sources of energy. Our ambition, of course, is to go beyond this and to drive it down by 35 percent, not just 20 percent, by looking for supplies of nickel and lithium that can prove a low a carbon footprint, whether it comes from virtuous mining solutions or through the recycling of batteries that have reached their, the end, their end of life. Because in Renault, our batteries are used, reused, and recycled. Now, we've 
almost we are, we've, we almost have 10 years of experience in the sales of electric vehicles. And therefore, we now have a total control over the battery's life cycle. We can give them a second life, for example, as a stationary usage in residences to ensure that uh, grid, the, the electric grid can be uh, relieved during uh, consumption peaks. We can also recycle the strategic metals in these uh, batteries by extracting them and purifying them with our partners Veolia and Solve, and this means that these materials can therefore be reused in new batteries. These activities make it possible to reduce our carbon footprint even further, or rather the carbon footprint of our batteries even further. We are also driving down the carbon, carbon footprint of our plants. Our level of CO2 emitted by vehicle per vehicle produced is among the lowest in the world. If taking all car makers into consideration, we are the most efficient, we will remain the most efficient car maker in those terms between now and 2025. Our plants are cutting down on their carbon footprints year by year. Tangiers, for example, is already carbon neutral. The sites of our electric hub or cluster in the north will also become carbon neutral by 2025, as well as our Cleon plant, where we make our electric motors. Our refactory in Fla will become the very first negative carbon plant in Europe that will, is entirely dedicated to the circular economy by 2030. Once again, in 2030, all of our European plants will be carbon neutral. Worldwide, the carbon emissions linked to our production will be reduced by half. And the, all of this is, of course, is going to serve our performance, and that is what is most important after all. Every single euro invested in decarbonization, in the decarbonization of our plants, will actually make it possible for us to save four euros. We are also concentrating our efforts where the main lever of decarbonization can be found, which is obviously emissions during the usage of our cars. We announced this when we announced Renolution. The Renault brand has, uh, has, the, has the ambition to become the, to have the greenest car mix in Europe, with 65 percent of its sales electrified by 2025 and more than 90 percent in 2030 for uh, passenger cars. Our LCVs with the hydrogen powered uh, hydrogen power that we are going to be putting on the market will also contribute to that. So totally by 2030, the level of emissions by during the usage of the group's vehicles will be reduced by 65 percent in Europe and 35 percent worldwide. Last we are ensuring that the whole of the life cycle of our cars can become a source of value that we can generate and capture at, uh, to our own profit as well as to the profit, obviously, of our customers. With the activities of the refactory, we will be renovating and refurbishing more than 120,000 vehicles per year between now and 2030. We will once again have control over the residual value of our used cars as well as of their batteries. We are aiming to reuse 60 percent of the batteries that we are putting back onto the market. And for our end-of-life batteries, 80 percent of the strategic substances that can can be salvaged from their recycling with our partners Veolia and Solve will be used to manufacture new batteries. So that's 80 percent. So thanks to all of these activities, by 2030, we will still be the, the leading car maker worldwide in terms of percentage of recycled materials in our new vehicles everywhere in the world, in all our brands. These activities for dismantling and recycling the components of our vehicles will generate more than a billion euros of turnover by 2030, which will not be, will be non-dilutive uh, on our profitability. And Clotilde will correct me if I'm wrong. In, on every single link of the chain, from upstream to all the way downstream, we are moving towards carbon neutrality, and we are notching up every milestone between 2025 and 2030. And we will continue to be very open and transparent about our environmental performance, uh, just as we uh, you can see today in the publication with the publication of our climate report. We continue to take care of the environment, but we are also going to take care of the 
safety of the users of our cars as well as the safety of our employees on their workplace. Let's start with road safety. In Europe, 23,000 people uh, actually die on the roads every day, either because of excessive speed or un inappropriate speed, or because they are dri driving under uh, the uh, influence of, uh, of uh, drugs or uh, alcohol. These are the main three main accidents, uh, three main causes of accidents. So, in order to uh, remedy this, we are, have set up a security or a safety roadmap with safety coaches. So detecting, guiding, and acting are the three missions of the Renault Safety Safety Coach. Now, like the Eco Score, our Renault vehicles will also propose a safety score or a safety rating. The principle is quite simple. We will analyze all the data that is fed back by the sensors in the car and can generate a very fine-tuned analysis of uh, driving habits, therefore make it possible to identify any any deviations uh, by the driver. So proposed as in partnership with, uh, with the insurance companies, a safety score will make it possible to encourage people to drive safer. And the very first studies that have been carried out on these systems uh, have shown that accidentology can be reduced by 20 percent by users of these solutions. Now, what about guiding? In real time, the data from the uh, sensors of the vehicle will signal uh, within the sat-nav any environing, environment risks or any risks that are coming up so as to alert the driver. And the, uh, so that, uh, and then in term, terms of, uh, uh, the, the sat-nav will also point out any uh, uh, curves or or um, turns on the on the road that are statistically more accident uh, accident uh, uh, that have a tendency to generate more accidents, and also the guide is going to act. So in real time, once again, if the data is shows that the uh, state of attention or the state of sleepiness of the driver is risky, then the car will take over. For example, if the sensors detect that the hands of the driver are no longer on the on the steering wheel, then the vehicle will automatically set up a safe uh, driving system. We will also act on speed. Uh, and our vehicles are equipped, of course, by uh, uh, an automatic uh, cruise um, control, which will adjust to the authorized speed, uh, depending on the traffic signs. And the regulator will also take into consideration the configuration of the road, for example, dangerous uh, bends or uh, roundabouts. Uh, and the and speed in our vehicles can be uh, can have a ceiling, and will the and will not go beyond 180 kph no matter what the model may be, whether it's Renault or Dacia. Now, after preventing, we also have to save. So we've set up two innovations for post-accident safety. First of all, fireman access or fire, the fire, access of firemen to the battery. When there's an accident with a severe impact that can uh, that d damages the body of a car, there's a specific risk in electric vehicles that the battery may catch, catch fire. In spite of the very high level of internal safety in our batteries, a fire can always be possible. So we have developed a specific fireman's access that makes it possible to directly drown the battery from inside and therefore to cut down on the uh, time for extinguishing the fire to just a few minutes. So this system is already in place in our electric and hybrid uh, rechargeable, so plug-in hybrid cars, and we will be deploying it on all of our e-tech launches in Europe, whether it's Renault, Dacia, or Alpine. Our second innovation is what we call the rescue code. If there is a violent, violent impact that uh, leads to severe trauma for passengers, the golden hour actually means the critical hour after the impact. And, criti and uh, experts know that during that one hour, if no appropriate care is given, 50 percent of people risk death. So every minute counts. We accompanied the development of a QR code 
that makes it possible to immediately identify the vehicle that has had the accident by the fireman. And therefore, they can immediately have the information of the architecture of the vehicle on their phones. This can save up to 15 minutes for the extraction of passengers. We have trained firemen in 12 countries of Europe to use this QR code, and we have uh, uh, handed over to them several hundreds of vehicles so that they can use them for training and use them in their training courses. From next year onwards, we will extend this rescue, rescue code to all vehicles uh, sold by the group in Europe. Now, our uh, safety coach roadmap, as you can see, is going to be progressively deployed on all our vehicles. From 2022 onwards, Megan E will have an automatic cruise control system that will be re regulated as on by default, and its maximum speed will be uh, at 160 kph. It will also be equipped with the uh, fireman's access on the battery and obviously with the rescue code as well. Now, security and safety and the health of our employees now. We protect our employees from the risk of accidents and uh, the exposure to dangerous materials within the framework of our hygiene, health and safety policy and on all of our industrial and uh, tertiary sites. Uh, from between now and 2030, we are aiming at zero accidents and zero diseases linked to work. Beyond just protecting our employees, we want to uh, really uh, have an optimum medical coverage for all of our employees worldwide. It will be, it will evolve and will be adapted to the markets in which we are present. So. We are also launching preventative uh, medical campaigns. The first one will start from this year onwards. And the aim of these campaigns are to talk about the uh, pathologies for, for which information and sensitization or, or awareness raising can really make a difference. And that's, the, uh, that's women's cancers and um, uh, cardiovascular diseases. These campaigns will be deployed everywhere in the world and supervised by our health teams in these countries. My third the third pillar is inclusion. We are going to ensure that we can promote the employability and equality uh, of our employees at every level of the company and also for mobility in solidarity. Now, first of all, employability of our employees. We all know today that all, only 8% of jobs in uh, France in the automotive sector is are actually linked to the new um, functions or the new professions of electrification or software or uh, data assessment, etc. By 2030, we, we consider that this will be uh, ramped up to almost 25% of jobs. These skills have become something that we cannot do without. And uh, they, they, for this, they are like the skills to do with recycling and the circular economy. So in order to accompany this transformation, we are creating the Reno University. So it's going to be built around the three clusters, electric, circular economy, data, software, and cybersecurity. And this university is going to train people to the jobs and the skills that the automotive industry is going to need tomorrow. So to begin with, it's going to be dedicated to the employees of the group in France, but it will train more than 2,000 people between now and the end of 2021, and almost 10,000 extra other people by the end of 2025, which will mean that almost 40% of the of the teams involved by this transformation will have been trained. Progressively, the activities of this university will uh, be extended to the rest of the world and to our industrial partners uh, uh, as well, with whom we will be pooling uh, design and uh, the designing of these tra these training courses and their broadcasting. For example, one third of the uh, employees of the electric uh, pole in our Cléon site will be will be trained on power electronics and the production and automated assembly of electric motors. 
these unique models uh, for 100, of 120 to 140 hours will be pooled with other players like Valeo. And our Reno University will also collaborate very closely with our academic uh, partners who are very well known on uh, ap applied research projects and on the co-development of uh, um, uh, training training courses that will give rise to diplomas and certificates. Uh, the employability now of is our foundations that are present in the world and in France are really using their resources to accompany young people and to reinsert uh, people who are far away from employment or from jobs. Between now and 2025, the action that uh, and that of the programs of solidarity developed in uh, different countries will also make it possible to accompany almost 20,000 people and in uh, helping them to find a job. Now, beyond employability, we are also working on parity. In the Renault Group, uh, we are lucky enough to have almost a quarter uh, of our employees being women. In the automotive sector, we are the, Europe, we are the, uh, the European car maker that employs the most women. But we are still very far indeed from other industries, and we are determined to progress. So we have decided to increase our ambition, first of all, by ensuring that women can grow into key positions in the in our uh, governance bodies in the top 4000 and the top 11000 people in the group in each of these categories we are aiming to have 30% of women by 2030 35% by 2035 and 50% by 2050 and simultaneously we will maintain our leadership in the reduction of the salary gap between men and women and in and we hope that we will be able to drive it down to zero everywhere in the group by 2025 lastly we are also working in the upstream part in order to attract more young women towards our industry and towards our company by 2025 our population of apprentices and of interns will be at uh, uh, an equal level, which will obviously give uh, the, the company a huge nursery of robust talents to draw, on, draw upon. Now, what about solidarity? That is the last component of our inclusion pillar. As a car maker, we design mobility in a very sol solid, solid, with solidarity built in. So mobility especially for the peri-urban and rural zones, mobility is still an, an, a condition that you cannot do without to get a job. So an, a job seeker, one job seeker out of two, has to give up on answering um, advertisements because they are not autonomous in their, in their mobility. So since 2015, we started working with an, an employment agency uh, and a microcredit agency, which is called ADIE, in order to propose to these jobless people who cannot be given a bank loan uh, to be able to, to lease a vehicle with an option to buy. We decided to multiply the, the beneficiaries of the system by a factor of 10 and to go from a few hundreds to a few thousands of, of uh, these rentals because we've decided to use our network and the vehicles that come out of the uh, uh, Fla Vio factory. So now let's talk about governance. Um, we, in, in order to put our environmental and societal commitments among the operational priorities of the company, we have set up a strategic CSR or ESG committee at the level of the executive committee in which will be represented, obviously, the main functions like industry, purchasing, engineering, human resources, and digital. All of the proposals will be presented and approved by the CSR committee of the board presided or chaired by Jean-Dominique Senat. The action plans will be co-built between the different functions, the brands, as well as the ESG or the CSR um, department of the group, who will ensure the deployment of these actions together, because, after all, it is the deployment that is the most important. 
At a daily level, our ESG strategy will be pushed within Renault by the functions. They will each contribute to the reduction of em emissions, the deployment of the safety roadmap within our vehicles and our sites for our employees, and will also work on employability and the diversity of their own teams. So, just like in Renolution, our ESG strategy is also going to be driven by our brands who will be putting into our vehicles and into our services the values, the principles, and the, and the commitments of our group. Renault is going to be the green brand with the most electrified range in Europe with a battery made in France and decarbonized plants. Dacia will, uh, will bring forward the values of solidarity with the initiative of inclusive mobility that I've just talked about. It will also aim at a frugal usage of resources in the design as well as the production of its vehicles. Alpine will, will be uh, carrying forward, among other things, our objective of parity with this She Races program, program which, prom uh, which promotes women in all of the elite and demanding métiers of automotive sport. Then lastly, Mobilize will use innovation, the tech innovations of the Software Republic to promote decarbonization of mobility of cities and of territories. I think our roadmap is a really clear one. In the economic uh, sense of a revolution, we have, to the economic sense that, uh, meaning the revolution already had, we are now adding on a social meaning as well as an environmental meaning. And these two new chapters are actually part of a, just a single corporate strategy. And we are uh, putting this plan as a reflection and to the, at the service of the raison d'etre or the corporate purpose that Jean-Dominique is going to talk to you about in just a minute. Thank you for your attention. Uh, ladies and gentlemen and dear shareholders, all the things that you've just heard certainly show talks about uh, the corporate purpose that we're all going to talk that we're going to talk about now and that I would like to reveal to you, although with some emotion. Luca has just reminded us of the main lines of the Renolution Plan, which, as you have seen, gives our group a tremendous impetus. He has also presented the three pillars of our corporate social responsibility or our ESG policy, which is designed to create value and performance. The strength of a company, of its long-term dynamic, its impetus, depends on the proper alignment of its values, its governance, and its strategy with the expression of its corporate purpose. If everything is aligned, the company is exceptionally strong. Because this alignment actually produces, generates substance and meaning. And meaning is what gives rise to trust, to the pride of belonging, to motivation, and to stakeholder commitment, and therefore to performance. The co corporate purpose is therefore the strongest vector for the competitiveness of companies. The report on the role of corporate companies and object of collective interest, which Nicole Nota and I wrote in 2018, shed much light on this concept of corporate purpose, which was taken up by the Pact Law in France. It proposed uh, especially that the corporate purpose should define a desirable future for the collective. In more graphic terms, I have often had occasion to say that the corporate purpose is both the roots and the lodestar of the company. The roots give the company its stability and its depth. It, they, they anchor it in, firmly in a historical, cultural, and geographical context. And we all know that Renault's roots, which have been nourished by French soil and uh, French soil and culture since 1819, are uniquely rich and strong. The lodestar is that desirable future towards which all energies converge, that perspective that allows the talents and expertise of all the players in the company not simply to be aggregated, but to multiply and thrive. And when the company is going through a crisis, when the horizon seems to be blocked and overcast, the purpose is that little piece of sky 
that point of light that multiplies energies tenfold and channels them towards a unifying horizon. Substance, essence, and meaning. This is what our purpose brings us. Its formulation was the outcome of a long process of maturation, which lasted over a year. Several stages were necessary for the conception of our purpose to be expressed simply and naturally. Initially, working groups analyzed hundreds of interviews with employees coming from a huge variety of professions and countries, coming from operational departments and from general management level. Simultaneously, a careful study of the company's culture was also conducted. This work was supplemented by discussions with external stakeholders, for example, our partners, our investors, NGOs, etc. All of this work gave us an incredibly rich body of material, which was hardly surprising. Then we had to start the work of formalization, of writing it down. It was, of course, rather frustrating, because not everything can be said without running the risk of diluting the message. But it was also an exciting job, because drafting is really the stage where we crystallize who we are and what, the, what role we want to play in the world of today and tomorrow. So the time has come. I suggest we take a quick look at some visuals that present our corporate purpose. We are caring, believing in responsible progress that respects everyone. Since 1898, our history has been written by passionate people who create innovative products in tune with popular culture and made to accompany life. We do this because mobility is a source of fulfillment and freedom. We believe that this freedom goes hand in hand with preserving the planet and living better together. That's why we challenge ourselves to limit our impact on the climate and on resources and to make mobility more inclusive and safer for everyone. We are daring, embracing the future with optimism. We are a place where people can be themselves, playing their part in a shared adventure. We are proud of our diversity, our French roots, and of our international presence, which makes us open to the world. We are strengthened by the alliance and by the constructive relationships we forge with our partners. From our very beginning, our spirit of innovation has taken us further, creating value, anticipating mobility needs, and bringing people closer. We are the driving heart of innovation, so that mobility brings us closer together. This sums up what Renault stands for and what we must do in the years to come. Driving the heart of innovation expresses the deeply human and generous dimension of Renault, as well as the creativity, inventiveness and technical quality of the group. But for us, technology and innovation are always at the service of people and never the other way around, because the ultimate goal is to bring us closer together, which is what today's mobility makes possible, and even more so tomorrow's. Allow me to insist on certain words in our purpose, to which I am particularly attached. Freedom, the symbol of our French Republic, and a fundamental aspiration, which can be experienced, for example, in a journey by car towards new encounters or new horizons. Progress. The progress we make every day to serve our customers, but also the progress that opens up new perspectives because we must always go further while remaining responsible and being respectful of everyone. Fulfillment. Because in a world that seems to be punctuated by an accelerating series of crises, we sometimes forget that fulfillment is the essence of human life. Daring because the future belongs to those who move the lines with the energy of passion. Okay, so 
now this is for people to who can uh, reinvent themselves uh, because they've been strengthened by their diversity and their roots so thus our purpose which is based on our french roots and is clearly anchored in our popular culture sets us a very bright lodestar to innovate every day so that mobility in complete safety is better shared allows us to live better and brings us closer to each other it is now up to each employee and um, uh, and of the group to embody and give life to this reason for being or our corporate purpose on a daily level and in order to do nurture it we're going to create a purpose committee at the end of the year while company generally opt for a stakeholder committee we decided to carry this further this corporate purpose committee made up of international personalities from a wide range of backgrounds and fields of expertise will be the real bridgehead of the group strategy and will enlighten the board of directors through its analyses and recommendations by reflecting on the environmental social and societal challenges so embodied by each and every one of the group's 170,000 employees throughout the world and as a vector of our collective strength and um, and competitiveness our purpose will accompany and inspire the Renault group in its new ambitions while bringing it back to the place where it belongs in the hearts of French people Mesdames, Messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, dear shareholders, in my capacity of the head of the Governance and Compensation Committee, it is for me to give you a summary of the activities of the Board of Directors and look at the items of compensation of members of the Board. Regarding the activity of the Board of Directors, the activity of the Board was once again intense in the year 2020. The Board of Directors met 12 times and the committees as a whole met as many as 19 times. All the information regarding the activity of the Board Board of Directors and his committees is detailed in the uh, Corporate Governance Report and indeed in uh, Chapter 3 of the Universal Registration Document uh, available on the company's website. This uh, report, which I uh, invite you to uh, consult for more information, also includes the conclusions of the assessment of the uh, performance of the board uh, carried out by an external firm. Uh, in this briefing, is, I will not go over all of the board's activities, but uh, simply go through the main uh, highlights. The first months of the year were, of course, uh, marked by the start of the COVID-19 crisis, which led the company to uh, adapt uh, its uh, activity urgently, in particular by deciding on site closures. From the start, start of the crisis, the board of directors uh, had exceptional meetings uh, in order to uh, regularly uh, reviewed the situation uh, with uh, top management. The board of directors was, in fact, closely associated uh, with uh, top management under the Del Bos in the of production, sales, uh, the financial situation, and indeed um, uh, sanitary measures uh, uh, set up for the protection of our employees. Uh, was intensify the company's uh, challenges and therefore uh, emphasize the need for uh, a cost reduction plan for the cost reduction plan that had that had been uh, drawn up by the uh, by top management, but indeed that had been considered by the board of directors as early as May 2020. The uh, cost reduction plan uh, was and continues to be uh, periodically monitored by the audit risks and uh, compliance committee. Now, even though the uh, economic condition uh, situation did not because of the 
second half of the year was marked by the assumption of office by Luca Di Meo, who uh, breathed new life into the company with his uh, uh, resolution plan, uh, the uh, broad uh, outlines of which were shared with the board of directors in July. Several sessions were organized between the general management and the uh, strategy committee, and indeed with the board of directors, in order to examine in depth the new strategic plan during the second half of the year. Presentation, uh, publication in January. The plan was unanimously approved by the Board of Directors. Funny, the Board of Directors, as well as the uh, Ethics and uh, CSR Committee, were involved in uh, defining uh, the uh, CSR strategy and in determining the raison d'etre, the corporate purpose, which uh, was just introduced to you. Let me turn to uh, well, membership of the Board of Directors. Let me remind you that the Board of Directors decided in 2020 not uh, to uh, renew uh, the uh, uh, terms of directors uh, who were reaching the end of their terms in order to reduce the number of directors uh, from 18 to 16 at the end of the 2020 general meeting. Moreover, the terms of three directors representing the employees expired in November 2020, and so elections were organized in October. And at the end of these elections, uh, the mandates of um, uh, Mr. Barra, Mr. Gentil, and Mr. Person uh, were renewed for a, person of, for a period of four years until, that is, end of November 2024. Regarding directors uh, or re uh, representing employee shareholders, Mr. Uh, Ostertag's term expires at the end of this uh, AGM. A call for applications uh, for uh, ap uh, applications were made in the fall of 2020 in line with the company's articles of associations to the supervisory board of the company's FCPE, that is the company that uh, uh, runs the uh, company savings plan, and uh, the employees holding uh, shares, uh, company shares as part of the uh, shareholding scheme, which uh, with a view to appointing candidates for the uh, post of director representing employee shareholders. And so one person was indeed designated. Um, and, and his alternate. So it was Mr. Noel Degrip, uh, who is a titular, uh, titular uh, candidate, and Mrs. Christine Giry, who is the, uh, uh, this, uh, the, 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 the deputy. Let's take a video. What's your uh, professional background? I was uh, I have a university background. I had a degree in uh, electronics. I was a fireman for some time, and then in 1996 I joined Renault. Um, I started working in the environmental protection department and worked with manufacturing in. Uh, Introducing the 1401 uh, uh, standard at the time, Greta Thunberg was not even born, but back then already Renault was involved in environmental protection. That was indeed a, a, a clear dimension of its manufacturing policies, not just in France but around the world. Uh, my own perception of uh, Renault is fairly simple, straightforward. I've been working at Renault for 25 years. I believe this is a company where uh, people can have fine careers. Uh, and uh, Renault brings together men and women of talent who uh, want to uh, join an adventure with uh, uh, common values. Now, uh, depending on the outcome of this vote, but I'll be delighted to join the board of directors. Uh, I also chair the board of uh, the supervisory board of the FCPE uh, uh, Investment Trust of uh, company uh, employees. Uh, I take this charge with uh, humility, but I'm also determined to uh, work for sustainable and well-balanced performance, balancing the uh, economic and social uh, aspects and. Uh, uh, I suppose th this is like t uh, team sports, and uh, in, it's the same on the board of directors. Uh, each and every one of us has a role to play. Right. Uh, regarding the other directors, uh, four terms of office expire at the end of uh, this uh, AGM. Uh, they are the terms of Mrs. Yu Serizawa, who is the director who was appointed on the proposal of Nissan. Mr. Thomas Courbe, a, directed, uh, a director appointed uh, at the proposal of French government. Mrs. Miriam Bensela Chacroun, who is an independent director. And Mrs. Marie-Annie Darmayak, who is also an independent 
Cabinet Director. On recommendation of the Governance uh, and Compensation Committee, the Board of Directors proposed to renew the terms of office of, the, of these uh, four directors, uh, and the, this is formalized in resolutions number six and nine to be voted on today. And so the term uh, would be then renewed for a period of four years, i.e. until the end of the 2025 for AGM, uh, ruling on the accounts for the year 2024. In addition, the Board of Directors Point uh, for a uh, for four years under resolutions number ten and eleven, two new independent directors who were selected uh, for <coughs> following a uh, process. Um, led by the uh, Governance Committee. So you have Mr. Bernard Delpit, who is with us, who is the Deputy CEO and indeed CFO of uh, the Safran, Safran Company. The Board of Directors proposed to include amongst uh, independent directors someone uh, with a, a robust uh, experience uh, in uh, uh, financial affairs with a, a good knowledge of the automotive industry. So let's take a look at uh, the uh, video of Mr. Delpit. Pit. background. Well, I started at the Ministry of Finance, where I spent about 10 years working at the General Inspectorate and then at the budget. Then I decided to work for the private sector, and I chose the automotive industry. I spent uh, seven years at PSA Peugeot Citroën as Deputy Managing Director of a joint venture in China between uh, Dongfeng and Peugeot. And then back in France, I was in charge of uh, accounts. Uh, um, control at uh, the company. Then I worked for the French Post Office and the Crédit Agricole Bank. And now I work as a CFO at Safran, which is in the um, aerospatial and defense industry. My perception of Renault is rather optimistic. Uh, well, we have a new uh, management team, but also I'm well aware of the major challenges ahead for Renault in uh, what is a very tough competition and the significant technological challenges were both for uh, uh, climate change but also uh, such issues as connected cars. So these are major challenges that I certainly hope I can uh, be useful there. Why do you want to join the board? Well, I'd be delighted to join the board. Uh, I do believe that with my experience as CFO and a good uh, knowledge of uh, what investors and shareholders expect from such a large listed company as Renault, and indeed improvement still needed in terms of uh, profitability, but also to uh, meet uh, expectations not only in financial but also in extra financial matters. Now, the third person who's, uh, who is proposed is Mr. Mazella. Mr. Frederick Mazella is the founder and chairman of Blablacar and the entrepreneurial co chairman of France Digital, the largest association of startups in Europe. The board of directors wanted to strengthen the board's skills in digital innovation and mobility, given the current challenges that the automotive sector has to present. Uh, has to face. I suggest you we watch a video presentation of Mr. Mazella. Mr. Frederick Mazella, CEO and founder of Blablacar. What about your professional background? I studied maths, physics, and computer science. I played the piano and the violin as well at a con cons conservatory. And I spent part of my time studying in the, in the United States at Stanford, where I also worked for NASA. And then I got the idea for Blah Blah Car. And that has actually occupied most of my life for the last 14 years, 15 years. Today, Blah Blah Car is the world's leading carpooling platform with a community of 90 million members in 22 countries. CO2 saving of 1.65 uh, 1. million tons per year. It's more responsible and shared usage cars of cars that has become a social phenomenon. And France is the country that carpools the most, and that shows you, you can be French and still innovate, a bit like Renault. What's your perception of Renault? For me, Renault is first and foremost about my childhood. Little by little, I also understood that it was a flagship in the uh, in, in French industry as well as internationally, a very innovative company. I also appreciate that Renault is a group that is very committed to the environment, especially when Renault was the first group to commit to reducing its carbon footprint. So the image I have of the Renault group today is that of a robust modern group for connected but also sustainable mobility. 
What motivated me to join Renault's board of directors is to bring my experience as an entrepreneur to decision making. In line with Renolution that was announced by Luca De Meo, I want to ensure that Renault is well and truly connected to the world of startups, which is my world. It's also a form of economic patriotism, if you like, because I want Renault to be a player that not just shines at the international level, but also is a great player in the mobility of tomorrow and, above all, a player in sustainable mobility, which is particularly close to my heart. Afin d'accompagner l'évolution du groupe. In order to accompany the evolution of the board of directors and to limit the number of directors, I propose to the board that my mandate be termina terminated a uh, year early from 2021, uh, So, and that was accepted. So my term of office will end at the end of this meeting. Therefore, at the end of the current AGM in 2021, and subject to the approval of the resolution submitted to the vote, the board of directors will be made up of 17 members. 69.2% of him will be independent, and 46.2% of whom will be women, excluding employee directors and directors representing employee shareholders. I will now move on to the second part of my presentation, which is devoted to the compensation of our corporate officers. You were asked to vote on several subjects for, for this particular meeting. First of, for, first of all, for the 13th resolution on the information relating to the compensation of all corporate officers for 2020, presented in the company's corporate governance report. Then, from the 14th to 16th resolutions, you were asked to vote on the compensation paid during or awarded in respect of 2022, Mr. Jean-Dominique Senard, Chairman of the Board of Directors, Mr. Luca de Meo, CEO, and to Mrs. Uh, Clotilde Delbos, who was acting CEO. Finally, the 17th and 19th resolutions asked you to vote on compensation policies for 2021 for the Chairman of the Board of Directors, the CEO, as well as the directors members of the Board of Directors. Now, concerning the 2020 compensation of Jean-Dominique Sénard uh, in his capacity as Chairman of the Board of Directors, the policy, remuneration policy for Mr. Sénard for 2020 provided for a fixed compensation of 450,000 euros over 12 months, excluding any other variable or exceptional remuneration or any allocation of shares or any compensation for his position as a director. I would also uh, like to remind you that in the interest of responsibility towards all stakeholders, Mr. Senard decided by mutual agreement with the Board of Directors to reduce his compensation by 25 percent from the second quarter of 2020 until the end of the year 2020. Therefore, the, the amount of compensation paid to him in 2020 is 365,625 euros. Concerning the 2020 compensation of Mr. Luca de Meo as Chief Executive Officer, let me remind you that the compensation policy for the CEO for 2020 provided for a fixed compensation for 1.3 million of 1.3 million euros over 12 months, variable compensation of up to 150 percent of the fixed compensation, subject to the achievement of performance criteria, and an attribution of 75,000 performance shares subject to a three-year presence condition. Mr. De, Mio, De Mio's fixed annual compensation for 2020 was paid to him on a pro rata temporis basis, as from his assumption of office on 1st July 2020, which represents an amount of 650,000 euros. Now, with regard to his annual variable compensation, the board examined the level of achievement of the performance criteria defined in the 2020 compensation policy and set the overall achievement rate of the performance criteria, criteria at 64.43 percent out of a possible maximum of 150 percent. Accordingly, Mr. Demio's variable compensation for 2020 was set at a gross amount of 418,773 euros. The payment of this compensation is conditional upon a favorable vote by this annual AGM under the 15th resolution. With regard to his long-term variable compensation, the Board of Directors awarded Mr. De Meo 75,000 performance shares 
in accordance with the compensation policy that was voted in by the AGM of 19th June 2020. Let me now move to the 2020 compensation for Mrs. Clotilde Delbos in her capacity as acting CEO until 20, 30th Jan, uh, June 2020. At the time of her appointment, the board of directors decided to maintain her employment contract with Renault SAS in her capacity as group uh, chief financial officer and to grant her additional compensation for her duties as acting chief uh, executive officer. The compensation policy for the acting CEO for 2020 provided for a fixed compensation of 371,000 euros for 12 months and variable compensation of up to 50 percent of the fixed compensation subject to the achievement of performance criteria, as well as an allocation of 27,500 performance shares subject to a three-year presence condition. Mrs. Delbos's fixed annual compensation for 2020 was paid to her pro rata temporis until the end of her duties on the 30th of June 2020. Furthermore, in the interest of responsibility towards all stakeholders, Mrs. Delbos had decided in mutual agreement with the board of directors to reduce her compensation for the second quarter of 2020 by 25 percent. As a result, the fixed compensation paid to Mrs. Delbos for her mandate in 2020 amounted to 162,000 euros. With regard to her annual variable compensation, uh, the performance criteria was similar to those, those of the CEO. The board of directors thus set the overall rate of achievement of the performance criteria at 64.43 percent. Therefore, the variable compensation of Mrs. Dilbos for the financial year 2020 was set at a gross amount of 104,665 euros. The payment of this compensation is obviously also su subject to a positive vote of this AGM uh, when considering the 16th resolution. With regard to her long-term variable compensation, the Board of Directors awarded Mrs. Delbos 27,500 performance shares in accordance with the policy voted by the AGM of 20, 19th June 2020. Uh, I'd like to end the year 2020 with the com elements of compensation paid to the members of the Board of Directors. For 2020, the directors received compensation consisting of a fixed and a variable part. And that variable part actually depends on their effective presence at the meetings of the Board of Directors and or the committees. The chairpersons of the committees, as well as the lead director, also receive additional fixed compensation for their duties. I would also like to remind you that the chairman of the Board of Direc Directors does not receive any compensation for his duties as a member of the Board of Directors. The new distribution rules dis approved by you in 2020 are shown here on the screen. As we announced in April 2020, in this context of the COVID-19 pandemic and in order to uh, ensure our responsibility to all the group stakeholders, the members of the board of directors unanimously decided to reduce their compensation by 25 percent for the 2020 financial year. As a result, the total compensation paid to the members of the Board of Directors for the 2020 financial year amounted to 949,396 euros gross. The last part of my presentation concerns the compensation policies for corporate officers for the 2021 financial year. Now, with regard to the compensation policy for Mr. Jean-Dominique Sénard as chairman of the Board of Directors, the board decided to maintain fixed annual compensation at 450,000 euros payable in 12 monthly installments. In accordance with good corporate governance practices, Mr. Sénard will not receive any variable or exceptional compensation, nor will he be granted any shares. Now, regarding the 2021 compensation policy for the CEO, which will apply to Mr. Luca de Mio, the board of directors decided to maintain his compensation structure with a fixed annual compensation of 1.3 million uh, euros, a variable compensation representing up, up to 150 percent of the fixed compensation and subject to the achievement of annual quantitative and qualitative performance criteria, and a long-term compensation con consisting of 75,000 performance shares 
whose definite whose final acquisition will be subject to the satisfaction of performance criteria assessed over three years, and to Mr. De Mayo's presence within the group at the end of the three-year period. Now, concerning the variable compensation of the chief executive officer, the board has also changed the quantifiable performance criteria in order to ensure a close link between the new resolution strategic plan and compensation policy. It is therefore proposed in relation to the 2020 compensation policy to remove one criterion and to add two new criteria. The return on capital employed criterion replaces the turnover criterion in order to prioritize profitability targets based on capital invested in line with the new strategy, strategy of value creation. And the criterion of fixed costs has also been added in, as the reduction of fixed costs is key for the first resurrection phase of the strategic plan to ensure the success of the second renovation phase of the plan. In addition, the other criteria of the 2020 compensation policy are maintained in a view of how important they are for the group. These are the group's operating margin, the free cash flow, cash generation, and CO2 emissions in, uh, linked up with the CAFE regulations. Each of these five criteria were given an equal weighting of 20 percent. Now, as far as qualitative criteria are concerned, they have also changed in relation to uh, the 2020 compensation policy in order to take into account the challenges of the new resolution strategic plan. The criteria of CSRO ESG commitments and customer satisfaction and quality have been maintained. The, uh, the achievement of these three qualitative criteria will contribute directly to the group's performance. Now, regarding long-term compensation, the chief, uh, the, the CEO will receive performance shares according to the same performance criteria as other group executives, subject to an additional performance criterion, which is the total shareholder return. And long-term compensation policy for 21 includes a new criterion, annual growth in net income per car which replaces percentage of models pr produced on an alliance platform. And obviously, this is also in line with the new strategic plan. In addition, an equal weighting of 25 percent has been assigned to all four performance criteria. As re regards post-employment benefits, these remain strictly identical to those previously approved in the 2020 compensation policy, namely a severance payment, a non-competition undertaking, and a supplementary pension scheme. I now come to the director's compensation policy for the 2021 financial year. It is strictly similar to the one approved in the 2020 compensation policy. It consists of a maximum annual compensation amount for participation in the meetings of the board of directors and in the meetings of each of the committees, which includes a fixed portion prorated pro according to the length of the mandate over the year, and a variable portion that is also prorated according to the rate of participation in the total number of meetings during the year. The variable portion related to participation in board and committee meetings takes precedence over the fixed part. In addition, the committee chairpersons and the lead director will receive an additional fixed amount in a view of their functions. The distribution rules provided for in the director's compensation policy are displayed on the screen. Thank you, and I will hand the floor now back to the chairman. Merci, Patrick, for this presentation. Thank you very much, Patrick, for this presentation. First of all, I would really like to once again emphasize the considerable amount of work carried out once again this year by the Board of Directors. Over the past two years, the Board has evolved in depth. All the committees are now well established. They are all active and they're all exciting and lively. As I can testify, the working meetings have become longer and they have become much more productive. 
I would like to express my gratitude to all the members of the board for the relationship of confidence, of trust, tr solidarity, and transparency that they help to build every single day. I would especially like to pay tribute to the always professional and committed activity of the committee chairpersons and of Pierre Floriot, our lead director. By my side, Mr. Floriot does very useful work and provides a talented link with our alliance partners by sitting on the Nissan board of directors and on Nissan's audit committee. The importance of the role of the employee representative uh, members of the board of directors can never be overstated. I would sincerely like to thank them for their precious contribution. Finally, Mr. Benoit Ostertag to today is leaving the board. Thank you, Mr. Ostertag, for all the work that you have put in. Lastly, I would also like uh, to express my gratitude to the directors representing the French state for the quality of their attention and their active and effective participation, as well as to the two uh, representatives of Nissan. A particularly committed director will be leaving the board of directors today, as you all know, and that is Patrick Thomas, who, in order to accompany the evolution of the board of directors by limiting the number of its members, proposed that he should end his own mandate one year in advance. I would really like to thank him warmly for his work and for his valuable contribution, contribution to the board. And he, of course, of which he has been one of the pillars in the last few years. I'm also very pleased indeed to welcome Bernard Delpit, Frederick Mazzella, and Noel de Grip to the board. Bernard Delpit has a long experience of financial issues, both in the public sphere and in large listed groups, and he has held operational responsibilities in the automotive industry as well, as you heard. Frederick Mazzella is a leading innovative entrepreneur and the founder of one of the most emblematic companies in the world of new mobility. I do believe that their experience and their high profiles will be invaluable assets to support the implementation of the Renault Group's new strategy strategic plan. As for Noel de Grip, his knowledge of the, of the co company and his commitment within employee representative bodies will be valuable assets for the board of directors, which, as you know, is always keen to listen with special attention to the voice of employees. I would now like to mention a key issue for our group, which is the operational functioning of the alliance. Our first objective, as you know, was to re-establish trust within the alliance. And I can assure you that this has now been achieved and established. Between France and Japan, but also within each region, joint work at the operational level between the teams of Renault, Nissan, and Mitsubishi is constantly ongoing with processes and tools that, are now, that now everyone is used to using. At management level, we also meet by video, obviously, alas, but at least twice a month, often more. And this tempo allows us to move, move forward very quickly and in a coordinated manner. Any and all subjects without any taboos whatsoever are regularly discussed dur during the operational committee meetings of the Alliance that I have the honor to chair. And the various members of the Alliance are delighted with this impetus. The leader follower principle introduced last year serves as a guideline to all of us for deepening cooperation, and all opportunities are carefully examined. Since 27th May 2020, when you may remember, that we announced the new impetus given to the Alliance, we have gone a step further. And the resolution plan announced mid-January by Luca de Mio has once again demonstrated the importance of the Alliance within the group's operational activities, as well as for grasping opportunities. Let me recall for the record that the Alliance is present in the world's four largest markets. It covers all vehicle segments, from mini cars to commercial vehicles, not forgetting sports cars. And the turnover covered by the Alliance's joint purchases is already over 100 billion euros. These simple facts show both the strength and the potential of the Alliance for the Renault Group and its partners. Today, in order to build the future, we are working, we have to work actually, on both continuity and acceleration. We are working on continuity with the continued pooling of our platforms, which allows us to confirm the objective of 80 percent of vehicles built on three common platforms by 2025. 
We still have continuity when, for example, the management of a portfolio of Nissan assets is by RCI is renewed, or when we continue our work sharing technologies. For example, the Nissan Juke uses Renault's E-Tech technology, and conversely, we use Nissan technologies on our autonomous drive vehicles. But we are accelerating when, for example, at a very operational level, we expand the number of parts and components that are subject to joint strategic reviews between Alliance Engineering and Alliance Purchasing to increase standardization and standardization, sorry, and commonality. More visibly, we are clearly accelerating when we give Mitsubishi the opportunity to maintain a profitable presence in Europe, when we decide to produce Mitsubishi vehicles in our factories, as we do with Nissan, for whom Renault produces LCVs in Maubeuge, as you all know. As for the key technologies of the future, here too we are accelerating. If I consider, for example, the immense amount of work carried out on the standardization of our battery cells, as well as on the electronic architecture of our vehicles. So our renewed approach to the alliance is based on collaboration and openness. It is based on the joint and systematic study of opportunities with mutual respect for cultures and skills. The clear and shared intention is to boost the performance of each company, enabling each to capitalize on its own strengths, to avoid duplication of resources, and to improve our efficiency. Apaiser. So now calmed, strengthened, and reinvigorated is a tremendous partners. We are now going to take uh, your questions, because this year, once again, unfortunately, we could not take the have you uh, here with us. And so, as I, we told you in the introduction, you have had the possibility since the 19th of April to and you can continue to do that uh, live during the AGM. I would remind you that these questions do not have the legal status of quote unquote written questions under, under the provisions of the French Commercial Code. The answers to those written questions have been posted on the page dedicated to our general meeting on our website. Many of you have sent us questions as part of the open shareholder dialogue that we decided to set up with you. And we are still receiving a number of questions at this very moment. Of course, questions individually, but we will try to deal with the main themes concerned by your questions and to try, we'll try and take the most representative ones. Kitri de Pelleport will read out the questions and uh, in a new feature this year, you also had the opportunity to send us in your questions by video message. I suggest, therefore, that we begin this Q&A session with a question we received on video from a member of the Shareholders Consultative Committee. Uh, chairman and dear shareholders and employees, my name is Loïc Duval. I'm a member of the Shareholders Consultative Committee. Renolution is about the renewal of Renault and to achieve a profitability in electric vehicles. What exactly does this mean in terms of integration for the value chain and also what will be the distinction made by brand? I also wanted to congratulate you as well as the teams of Renault for the management of the company in these very difficult economic conditions and this very difficult health crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you for this question. I'm going to give the floor to Luca who will be able to answer it. Well. This is a really important question, and it, uh, this, you know, it requires a very structured answer. I'm going to try and uh, so that I can leave space uh, for other questions. It's quite clear that Renault is a leading company now with uh, in electric vehicles. So I and we have a lot of experience in that. But I think that even we have an advantage, an edge as well, in terms of technology and costs uh, over our competitors. So most probably over the next few weeks, we are going to be unveiling a strategy that will make it possible for us uh, uh, to clearly show a closer control of the value chain than we had uh, so far in terms of partnerships, in terms of uh, the you know full control of all of the bricks that will ensure that Renault keeps its leadership. So I don't want to be too 
But uh, I think that uh, with the production of batteries, with the possibility of getting batteries, because that's going to really going, going to be the challenge over the next few years, choosing the right uh, um, chemical formula, uh, you know, having the right synergies with the alliance, all of this will really position us well. Now, for the different brands, we have quite a idea because Renault has is supposed to become has to become a clearly electric oriented in Europe and so I think we are going to be aiming at uh, you know the highest electric uh, um, inclusion compared to other brands and we are organizing ourselves to do that you can see the products here behind us as well so I think for Dacia the philosophy is going to be linked to how far we can offer cars that are affordable. Because obviously, in the electric cars are always more expensive than ICE engine cars. We, Everyone knows that. But we've shown that with Spring, we were able to actually bring in a solution that is a typically Dacia solution for Spring. And for Alpine, the cho choice is very clear, I think, for many people. It uh, may not be very clear because we haven't maybe discussed this as much as we should have, but uh, in the future, we are really going to push Alpine towards pure a pure electric brand. And Alpine will make it possible for us to experiment with the new t new batteries, with uh, higher technologies and all that, because that's the way the that brand is positioned. So, of course, I can't forget Mobilize. Mobilize quite quickly is also going to start looking at the development of appropriate vehicles for new mobility, new mobilities. And it's quite obvious that we're talking about urban mobility, so obviously zero emissions, right? So that's obviously going to be electric vehicles, because that's the best solution. The next question comes uh, from Mr. Michel Levet with the development of electric vehicles and indeed with uh, hydrogen cell vehicles. What's the plan for the recycling of uh, mechanical plants and their staff? Well, that, that, that is a fundamental question. In Lucas' strategic presentation, we know exactly where, where we're going towards indeed electric cars and hydrogen cells. I mean, they're, they're both electric, but in any case here, we're looking at fundamental issues and we're very much committed to keeping our people. Now, when it comes to uh, converting uh, our, our plants and indeed uh, up, uh, skilling our, our employees, uh, this is fundamental if you want to keep abreast of new technologies. And maybe uh, Luca can tell us more about the training of our people in particular. Well, yes, says Luca Di Meo, uh, experts believe that, uh, th I mean, this is a transition towards uh, uh, electric cars, and we're looking at, uh, uh, I mean, f in the whole uh, supply chain, we'll, uh, uh, value chain, we're looking at 50,000 jobs on the line. So there's a major challenge there. And, of course, uh, Renault, as a leading uh, automaker, is very much concerned, because we're looking here at thousands of people who must be um, uh, taken, as it were, as it were, across the river. Um, now, uh, uh, we have given it some thought, and uh, some uh, novel ideas have been implemented. In particular, we've uh, uh, turned around the Flin uh, plant. Uh, um, Initially, this was just an assembly line, and now we're turning this into a center of excellence uh, for the circular economy and the recycling of uh, parts and cars. Uh, at uh, uh, Cléon, uh, well, you maybe we know that we are working on that too. And in the north uh, part of the northern part of the country, uh, where uh, we uh, were. Uh, where manufacturing was slowing down. Now we are turning this into a major uh, plant for electric cars. Now, that's for the plants, but for our people, we're training our people, of course. We are up-skilling uh, them. And it's not just, by the way, a, a matter of, uh, of a CSR. I mean, this is a strategic issue for the company. It's uh, uh, in the company's own interest to make sure that these people are properly trained. Uh, we're looking at 10,000 people by 2025 who will be trained to new skills and new, uh, new jobs, really. Really, and uh, this is a, a challenge we want to take 
up. I mean, of course, we uh, uh, have a responsibility for our employees, but this is uh, the, 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 the future of the company is at stake. This is a challenge we take very seriously indeed. And the en energy transition comes uh, at a cost, but it does provide new opportunities as well. And uh, France, as uh, one of the leading economies of the world, uh, should take it upon itself to uh, uh, drive uh, the whole industry up the value chain. And as Renault uh, accounts for, well, 30 uh, percent of this industry, and indeed 30 uh, percent of our, our people work in France, and of course it is for us to drive, to drive uh, that transition. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Luca. We now have a question from uh, Jacques Léger Le Le from the uh, uh, Shareholders Advisory Committee. Good afternoon. Uh, the uh, emergence of electric cars uh, uh, will mean a new deal in terms of competitive advantage. Uh, IC engines will be phased out. Uh, and uh, that, uh, well, uh, that used to be one of our competitive advantages. Now, uh, Renault has uh, announced uh, the e-tech uh, technology. Now, can you uh, tell us just what is meant by e-tech and in terms of uh, well, competitive advantages vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, traditional uh, or hybrid solutions, or indeed uh, PHEV, or indeed uh, full EV vehicles. Can you uh, give us details on that? Thank you. Well, you're referring to these very exciting technologies, and indeed Renault is uh, very proud of having developed these technologies. Well, there's technolo technological expertise, and maybe Luca can give us details. Well, look, uh, uh, let me try and make it uh, as simple as possible. E-Tech is one of the nuggets that I discovered when I joined uh, uh, Renault. I found that, uh, well, th there were uh, seven years of research by uh, Renault engineers uh, that have enabled the company to uh, produce a, a tool that is fully suited to the energy transition, it will help, uh, uh, help us bridge that gap. Um, but of course, uh, that has been uh, seen in the, in the media. Uh, Renault's solution is best adapted to new driving solutions, especially in Europe. So the great uh, advantage of e-tech is uh, that, well, you, you're doing away with the tr traditional gearbox. So with that uh, part um, uh, out of the out of the way. Uh, now we have a simpler uh, looking model, but uh, it does mean that not only can we uh, improve performance, but very quickly indeed uh, we can uh, have highly competitive manufacturing costs because there are fewer critical parts. Now the good news there is that uh, if uh, hybrid accounts for 30 or 40 percent of the mix by 2030 in Europe, well that will means that we have our solution at hand, and E-Tech is, uh, well, is the uh, standard uh, hybrid and rechargeable um, uh, hybrid. Um, and so uh, with, uh, with one, uh, as it were, technical step, we cover both uh, markets because the, what does make the difference is the, the size of the battery. So it's a smart uh, concept in uh, technological terms. So Gilles Le Borgne um, can, uh, can tell us uh, more. Uh, but uh, that, uh, in a nutshell, is what it's all about. Now, I, I, I would like to uh, point out that Renault's uh, advantage there is that with uh, e tech we can, uh, of course, meet uh, uh, the expectations of the hybrid market, but we, there's the great expectations in uh, uh, pure electric. And, uh, uh, and uh, with the alliance, we do have, uh, we can achieve economies of scale, and we can scale up, indeed, our developments uh, on, on the full, uh, full EV. So it's, we're not just focusing on just one solution. We can adapt our powertrain mix to um, to new, uh, well, different uh, technological developments on different markets expectations, and that's a great competitive advantage. Well, if I may add, uh, <coughs> as a user of the plug-in uh, hybrid capture, I can tell you this is really comfortable to drive, uh, especially on the road. I mean, this is a, um, a, a one minute of uh, advertising for our own products. And, uh, now we have a question from uh, Mr. Utkar. 
uh, who said, well, uh, we seem to be lacking behind the competition. Uh, could uh, we uh, lag behind again in 2021, or can we uh, catch up, especially uh, with uh, SUVs, especially through our partnership with Nissan? Well, look, says Mr. Luca Di Meo, um, we are working hard on improving quality, uh, 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 and especially you know, in the sales uh, department, we've decided to uh, turn the system around uh, towards value rather than uh, uh, high volumes that were, in fact, dilutive in terms of uh, profitability. Now, of course, in the short run, uh, there's a price to pay for that. Uh, but um, that's money well spent, in a way, because uh, eventually we'll be arriving at new uh, uh, pricing and uh, better residual values and making your brands more attractive overall. That is our, uh, as it were, uh, our, gam uh, well, our gamble, as it were. But we, uh, on the one hand, uh, you have the pandemic, you have the components, you have uh, you have fires left, right, and center. Uh, so, of course, uh, uh, there, there is a, a, um, a combination of events, but um, the uh, share of sales to individuals, to uh, private uh, vehicles, which is the most uh, profitable uh, share, um, is uh, gaining ground. We gained as many as nine percentage points. So it's, this is very encouraging indeed. Now, together, we decided that we would um, address our sales policy based on a uh, well, the concept that we should have uh, enough of a portfolio to uh, be able to uh, to meet. Uh, uh, changing demands, but uh, the overall uh, inventory levels are supposed, well, we want to bring them down by 25 percent. Now, that again uh, will pay off in the medium term, but uh, this decision was made and it is being implemented as part of uh, a, a revolution. The next question comes uh, uh, from Mrs. Micheline Kova from uh, the Shareholders Advisory Committee. Bonjour, monsieur. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm, I have a question about the competitiveness of the Renault brands. Uh, uh, the concept of differentiating uh, the Dacia and Alpine uh, brands, and we're well. Uh, uh, is a very promising development, although we don't have the details. But for the Renault per se, uh, what is the main competitive advantage vis a vis the competition? Thank you. Well, another beautiful question, isn't it? Uh, but uh, uh, it is a very relevant question indeed. Uh, Renault uh, is uh, well. Uh, uh, is a mainstream uh, volume brand, as it were, uh, but uh, it is um, well. It, it doesn't fall into a, a small niche such as uh, Alpine, uh, which uh, looks at a, a very specific clientele, and uh, and because we are general purpose main. Uh, uh, brand, we have to have uh, some something for everyone. Um, so it uh, makes it difficult to have a very clearly delineated uh, profile. However, one thing we've said is that Renault uh, across the board should be uh, uh, state of the art in terms of uh, electrification and habitization. And the car that you have ne uh, next to me, I mean, uh, is of course. Uh, is an um, iconic uh, car, especially in Europe. But uh, although you have a, 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 well, a fine image out there, but uh, what you what's behind the scene there is that we are putting on the line an electric car that is not just attractive, but a in the R5 uh, a Renaissance project, we are, well, <laughs> there is a whole organization behind this, of course. There's a, a battery uh, a plant, and uh, and uh, Gilles Le Bon's uh, people are making it all happen. But the idea is to come up with an electric car, uh, affordable, I mean, at the same price as an ICE engine car. And that is our challenge. I mean, we want to make it happen. And it is, uh, of course, inter alia technological challenge. That's one thing. But there's another point I would like to. Uh, to another point I'd like to make, we uh, Renault cars should be smart cars, should be cars that keep improving. And so uh, the whole business of uh, connectivity, data, uh, artificial intelligence, um, this will be part of uh, the solution. This is 
what will differentiate Renault. But of course, uh, we have to work on quality, we have to work on design. Uh, improvements uh, will happen across the board. But on these two dimensions, we will be uh, building a position, I mean, to the future, that is, but on the one, but at the same time, very consistent uh, with uh, uh, Renault's uh, history and tradition. Uh, Renault has always been, a, as I said, a mainstream brand, but uh, with a human face, a human dimension. And uh, what we're trying to do here is to turn these cars into something almost human, but technology makes it possible. Uh, Luca, for this uh, uh, answer. Uh, Kitri, what's the next question? Yes, we have a video question from Alain Fabre. Depuis le départ de Carlos. Uh, since the, the departure of Carlos Ghosn, we get the impression that Renault, in spite of its uh, uh, 43 uh, uh, stake in Nissan, has lost control of Nissan with uh, uh, Japanese management who uh, has no concern for uh, their uh, majority uh, shareholder. So um, uh, how much control do you have over Nissan? And can you tell us about Nissan's performance? Well, I'll uh, take this question maybe because uh, there are things that I've uh, that you've just said that I uh, cannot uh, uh, accept. Uh, uh, Renault's uh, connection with Nissan has been stable uh, for many years, and in in terms of uh, um, shareholdership, uh, the the relationship is uh, stable. Now, uh, what I can tell you is that Nissan has remained a partner in spite of the challenges of this uh, uh, of this uh, year. Uh, of um, uh, pandemic, I mean, we couldn't travel across, and yet our relationships have gone even more intense. Uh, the, uh, and I can tell you, we spend hours uh, at board meetings. Uh, indeed, uh, we sit uh, on uh, Nissan committees. I can tell you, we spend many hours uh, in the uh, alliances. Uh, governing bodies, uh, uh, we meet more than two or three times a month, and these are very lengthy uh, sessions. And so uh, I don't know what uh, gives you the idea that we're losing control. And in fact, the question doesn't make sense. We're, we're, it's not a matter of one controlling the other. This is a partnership, and this is a very strong partnership indeed. And uh, 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 our Nissan partners listening to me right now will certainly confirm this, because I, ca I can confirm this. Uh, we have sound relations uh, showing even more potential, uh, but um, uh, the alliance is there, and it's working, uh, and the bonds are strong. And I give you a few examples in the years to come, uh, our cooperation will bear even more fruit. But uh, let it be clear that this uh, alliance is, is incontrovertible. As to Nissan's performance, it is not for me to say. But in fact, the, the, the numbers will be published uh, shortly. As you know, the fiscal year uh, for Nissan is uh, three months behind uh, our own year. So it is not for me to divulge anything. But uh, of course, Nissan faced the self same challenges uh, that Renault faced, and uh, and of course the same causes uh, led to the same effects. But uh, Nissan's uh, bounce back, rebound strategy um, is underway, and uh, we've been working with Nissan's boards and uh, Nissan's teams. And I can assure you that uh, well, uh, our converging paths are uh, mutual uh, reinforcing, and the complementarity is 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 clear every day. Thank you. We have a question from Antoine Riffonneau. The Renolution plan uh, assumes that uh, price uh, vehicles will be repriced, but uh, does this mean that uh, quality will improve as well? Well, look, uh, says Luca Di Meo, um, this um, is, um, of course, uh, this gives me an opportunity to um, clarify a point that was made on, uh, on 14 January, because that announcement may have been uh, uh, misconstrued, at least by, 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 by the media. Let, let me be clear about this. Yes, uh, we decided to uh, reprice our vehicles, at least on certain markets. And uh, indeed, uh, six percentage points shows that there was potential, and uh, we were able to uh, to uh, to gain 
gain this in a matter of months. So that, that is short term. But Renolution is proposing to uh, build a, a an offer that, well, not uh, Renault, but Dacia and Alpine. But uh, overall, we're pulling the whole uh, uh, lineup up, as it were. 70% of the vehicles, will, uh, instead of having 70% in the A or B segment, that is small cars, we're moving to a situation where in 2025 we're looking at maybe uh, 20, uh, well, 50 percent of the cars will be in the C segment, whereas now, unfortunately, the C segment only accounts for a small portion of our lineup, maybe 15, 15 percent. Now, the average uh, price paid for a Renault car uh, will be higher, but we're not talking about the same cars. It's not uh, we're looking at different cars. But, of course, when you um, move up the line uh, and uh, looking at the next generation of SUVs, for instance, well, of course, uh, there will be uh, uh, even more stringent quality requirements. And of course, we, we, we're working on that. Uh, so and to, together with Philippe garon buteau and I, I believe uh, he is in the audience, isn't he? He's in charge of quality. Uh, this is a, uh, a challenge, uh, a constant challenge for us. And quality um, uh, is uh, a challenge not just for uh, engineering, but also for procurement and, indeed, for manufacturing. But uh, the trends are looking good. Uh, based on the indicators, the, the feedback we're getting. But we decided to focus on two areas where we really uh, want to uh, reach excellence, reliability and sustainability. Uh, we are working hard to uh, make sure that we uh, achieve, establish uh, top-level positions uh, on the market on these two fronts. And indeed, the prototype that Philip and uh, his teams have built, this Zoe, that can uh, have a range of a million kilometers that can go for a million kilometers. Uh, I mean, how, how can you uh, achieve this? Well, uh, that, 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 of course, uh, is quite a challenge uh, for mobility platform because we're, we're not selling cars. We're selling, we're selling uh, miles. And of course, you want that one car to be able to drive the longest possible stretch. So that's, that's the challenge. But if we do look at the figures, and that is true for the entire automotive industry, um, the quality items are more to do with software. And uh, that is, of course, where we need uh, to uh, to uh, organize, because uh, hardware quality is not the same thing as software quality. And indeed, right now, uh, we are getting the right people. We are uh, getting the right structure to to become, uh, to get, uh, well, the top of the range. But uh, believe you me, I've, uh, I've I've been through these challenges before, and everybody's facing these challenges. No solution is simple. It's always uh, complex. You have maybe uh, 50 calculators in the, in the average car. And just to give you, in an average car today, uh, there are more uh, lines of code than you had in a 747 Boeing aircraft. So you're looking at major uh, technological developments, and that makes them very complex in terms of software. So the value will be right there, and that's what we'll be. That's where we're working. That's uh, a, a, something we, we, we have to address every day with Philippe and his people. Mr. Eric Guillaume sends the next question. Hello. Given the allocation plans that were recently done in Spain, as well as recruitment that is going to be done, and given, given restructuring in France and the departure plans, what is the future of Renault in France? Is industry still profitable? Well, you know, we will – Luca did talk about this during his, uh, his presentation. Let's be clear. We consider that Renault has a considerable future in France and that Renault will very quickly be seen as a, a huge leader in the automotive industry in our country. All of these uh, orientations we have we've decided to take with the new plants uh, that we are going to lo load up with uh, work in France, all of this is going to come true quite quickly. Maybe, Luca, you can talk about it. Luca de Mayo. Well, you know, um, certainly we are not going to keep this a secret. We did look at what the impact of the resolution plan could be if it is properly executed with, uh, uh, you know, with all of its elements and uh, with the right timing. The resolution plan would represent for France an extra GDP of 8 billion. So this is not a detail, far from it. It's quite clear that the idea is that to push the French uh, 
part of the highest part of the value chain. So that is hybrid cars and connected cars with lots of software, things like that. So these are there are projects that we haven't had in the system for a very long time, like the project for FLA, or where, for example, you know, our ambition is to actually create in the medium term more turnover and more more jobs than we actually have today when we are, where we are assembling cars there. Or the North, uh, North Cluster one, which is going to, ha you know, going to make a battery plant, an electric car plant, etc. So I really think that the challenge is going to be to convince everyone that that the industrial plan for Renault in France need to be a, needs to be a modern plan. Because, uh, you know, you, the, France is part of the first world. We can't just continue to assemble cars or use, you know, just talk about the company in terms of the numbers of cars we produce. Why don't we talk about the value that we can create, the quality of the jobs that we are creating on French territory? That's what we want to do. We want to put France back at the heart of our strategy. And that's what we've done with the revolution to ensure that Renault is part of the conversation once again, but that Renault should push modernity and should play its role uh, to, in order to drive this modernity in the French state. And, you know, sometimes, of course, it can hurt. It can mean certain changes that may not be easy or may not be uh, easily acceptable by in certain places. But in 10 years' time, if everything works as it should, everybody will thank us. And that really is our objective. And beyond that, of course, we have to look after all the other countries because there's Spain, Turkey, Morocco, Brazil, India. Uh, we've got responsibilities in all these countries as well. So we've got to do the job. But very clearly, France now is a priority for us in the sense that, you know, the, we are going to revolutionize the whole system. Well, I think this certainly uh, uh, confirms what we've just said. When I talked about the leadership of uh, uh, France, we are, have FLA in mind. You know, a couple of years ago, a lot of people t told me that FLA didn't have much of a future. It was probably going to be closed down. And I must admit that I was really sad when I heard that. And today we can confirm that FLA is probably going to become an example and an exceptional industrial plant or, and a leader. We're already very, very proud of it. And so I look at the change that's already happened, you know, given what people thought a few years ago. Well, says uh, Luca de Mio, Jean-Dominique, there's another point, which is that the validity of this, com of this plan is also recognized by other companies. They've come forward to join hands with us. And that shows that there's potential. We're not the only ones. I talked about Veolia, Solve. And I hope that all of this will help to reassure Renault's shareholders on our role and the role we are playing on our national territory. The next question is a video question from Mr. Alain Fabre. On the 14th of January, you announced an objective for um, an operating margin of 3% for 2023. This was considered as being extremely disappointing by the financial community. Could you maybe tell us uh, now, three and a half months afterwards, can you raise this objective, raise the target, and give this operating margin a little more uh, more optimistic trend, maybe? Yes, Luca. Luca is looking at Clotilde Delbos and saying, I'm going to give you the floor because I can tell you want to answer this question. Well, says Luca de Meo, you know, in, in Renault, the tradition was to promise things that were very ambitious and not to achieve those objectives. So when we built this plan, Clotilde and I, we decided that we had to aim something at something that we could absolutely guarantee to the market, to our uh, shareholders, to everyone. We considered, we've always considered that that 3% was a flaw, right? It's not the ceiling, no way. So this is the minimum threshold. And so, uh, obviously, as soon as you've set this kind of target, you're thinking about how to beat it. And it's true that over the last three months, we haven't really had got very many elements that uh, have pushed us to be more optimistic. 
But you know, plan is a plan. You can't change it every three months. That's the whole point of this plan. You have to look at the years to come, and every single day you try and add a little brick to the wall of this very robust house that you hope you're building. Uh, uh, yes, you know, I would like to add something. You know, it's only been three months. Three months is really not much at all. And what we can say is that the, the elements that we presented uh, for this resolution plan, especially for resurrection, is really moving forward well. We, well, we've already said this publicly for pricing, for cutting costs, all of this, we are doing well. But external factors mean that we have to remain, uh, we can't be too optimistic right now. But we certainly hope to beat this, uh, you know, we hope to go largely beyond it. But we can't do, we can't tell you that yet because we are still very much in part of the of uh, resurrection. Yes, I think that was clear. Do we have any other questions? Yes, Mr. Michel Jarry, who's, Jarry, who's asking, why have you given up on the scenic? Luca, I think you can answer that. Well, Luca, the mayor says, I think, you know, I think that that's an exceptional car, frankly. But unfortunately, the way the project was built was that we were not going to make any money on it. And that uh, market segment is being reduced every year, whereas SUVs are keep, uh, carrying on in increasing. And we're not very competitive in SUVs. And that is why, with Lawrence, with Gilles, with the whole team, we are preparing a whole range that is focused on crossovers and SUVs, like electrified or, le or electric, etc. Okay. But that's what the market's looking for, SUVs and crossovers. And, uh, you know, MPVs or monospaces are not really the trend anymore. But at the same time, if you love the name Scenic, uh, there's no reason why we have to give up the name Scenic. But the concept of an MPV is just not booming uh, uh, like it was 10 years ago when Renault actually invented that uh, that uh, market segment. I was uh, working for Renault when we brought out the first Scenic. It was fantastic. It was really surprising. But you know, even the best things come to an end. There are cycles. And this we've come to the end of that cycle. We have to move on to other things. The next question was asked by Mr. Mr. Bernard Lebihan. Experts estimate that onboard intelligence will represent 60% of the value of a vehicle by 2030, although only 20% now. This means a lot of investment in software platforms beyond the investment that's necessary for a material platform. Have you planned at the level of the alliance the uh, uh, to commonalize this new software platform, which will maybe become a sort of um, sort of operating system for future vehicles. Mr. Luca de Mayo, yes. My answer is yes, because, you know, we talk about software, and it's true that 50 percent uh, is something that does ring bells for us, because we also believe that in a few years' time, a large part of the value of our vehicles is going to be in, a, in their software. We are preparing for that very much so. And you have to keep in mind that uh, in this whole discussion and the setting up of the leader follower system, Renault has the leadership on electronic architecture. So we are very, very much involved and committed in the development of the new electronic architecture. And we are also setting up an organization that is well adapted to this challenge from a technical point of view. It's uh, you know based on the kind of things we do for hardware traditionally and the whole of the development of software uh, for cars with our partners. And then another decision was taken in the middle, which was to create software factory, where the whole of the IT and technical part were actually set up together. We have some very, very talented people in the system. You know, we talked about uh, our friends, our colleagues who are working in Toulouse, for example. That's the X team of Intel that has been organ uh, integrated into Renault's organization. So we've got people who are really up there with the best in uh, these fields. And I think that we're doing pretty well, actually. But I think that there's still a lot of work to be done 
on the software part. That's what I was saying earlier. You know, we want to be as good at this as we want to be on the electrical part, okay. uh, the electric vehicle part. And so, Gilles, would you like to add something, maybe, please? We'll find someone will find you a mic. So, Gilles, uh, Gilles Leborn, who is our uh, uh, director, uh, EVP Engineering. Well, it says Gilles Leborn, actually, you've, you've said it all, So, but clearly it's very, very important for the future. So today we've got about a thousand engineers uh, who are working in within the software factory, and we're continuing to develop this, and we are indeed moving towards systems who will have, uh, which will have a sort of uh, um, single uh, foundation software system, uh, which which is actually going to act like an OS, like the OS in the cars. You're right. Okay, we can take one last question. Okay because I can see that time is getting away from us. The last question comes from Luis Torado. In how long, how long is it going to take us to see a hydrogen-powered car in the Renault uh, uh, lineup for as a passenger car? Well, it's going to take some time, because they're starting with LCVs. Luca, do you know? Well, I think you're right. We are concentrating on commercial vehicles, but let me explain why for hydrogen, you know? This makes it possible also for me uh, to add, a, to uh, talk a little bit about this joint venture that we've set up, which is called Plug Power. Yeah. So I think everyone should know about this. This is a technology that comes from the United States for the for the battery, the fuel cell. So we want to integrate this fuel cell into our cars, and we are doing that part of the work ourselves. Uh, in the future, we also want to uh, set up a plant that will produce this kind of battery. But the potential deal with plug plug power also means uh, infrastructure and uh, and getting decarbonized hydrogen, which you can do in France with competitive uh, prices. It's possible in France, and therefore this is something that will help us position ourselves as leaders in this field. <clears throat> We must also keep in mind that we've got, we've had hydrogen vehicles, hydrogen-powered LCVs on the road since 2005. And why have we done this? We are pioneers in this field, you know. We did this because there is no alternative to diesel for uh, commercial vehicles. Whereas uh, for electric cars, you've, you know, for other cars, you've got electric cars. Because uh, the amount of range you need, you know, for small and medium-sized cars, you can use an electric vehicle. It's not a problem. But if you're on the road for 600 or 700 kilometers, then you will need a lot of batteries, and those batteries are going to be extremely heavy and also very expensive. So the idea of having a range extender to have an engine with a little bit, with a, a small battery, and having another engine with hydrogen will mean that we won't uh, need to use too many batteries and use. And for this kind of usage, you know, 600, 700 kilometers of range, it'll be feasible. At the beginning, of course, it's going to be expensive. But very quickly, I do believe that we should be able to drive the price down to a competitive price. At least I hope so. And I hope and I think that hydrogen vehicles, uh, cars, hydrogen cars uh, in Renault is probably going to come after 2030. Don't ask me whether it's going to be 31 or 34. I don't really know exactly. We ourselves don't know. We haven't really dis defined our way forward, uh, you know, from then onwards. But I think that that might be the horizon you were talking about. But, you know, if we can begin by getting 30 percent of the market of LCVs uh, with hydrogen-powered uh, LCVs in Europe, we would have done something that's pretty coherent with our, with our positioning in this field. Okay, so so that's what we can say in terms of uh, dates. But I think we must be we must realize how lucky we are to live in France because we have public authorities who really believe in alternative sources of energies, energy, and also it's because we in France have electricity that is uh, ma manufactured with uh, decarbonized from decarbonized sources because we use uh, nuclear energy and this is. It gives us sovereignty, but also it gives us a great idea of how to move forward with um, and keep our leadership. There you are. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, we've uh, really uh, gone through the, uh, your questions. The Q&A session is now over, and we're going to announce the result 
of the votes on resolutions. And now I'm going to give the floor to Kitri de Pelpa. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the AGM was asked to vote on 22 resolutions, uh, 21 ordinary and one extraordinary. Let me remind you that in accordance with the exceptional measures provided for by the ordinance of March 25, 2020, and the decree of April 10, 2020, as modified and indeed extended in particular by the ordinance of December 2nd, 2020, and indeed the decree of March 9th, 2021. The general meeting of shareholders is being held today in camera, and as a result, the votes were closed at 3 p.m. yesterday. Before presenting to you for each of the resolutions the results of the shareholders' votes, I would also remind you that in accordance with the governance agreement concluded on February 4th, between 2016, between the state shareholders and Renault, the votes of the French state are subject to a ceiling according to the level of, of the quorum. And so this year, the state votes were capped at 17.9% of the voting rights for all resolutions, with the exception of the third and seventh resolution. Consequently, beyond this uh, sitting threshold, the voting rights of the French government were exercised in a neutral manner, that is to say, 50% for and 50% against for ordinary resolutions and 63.3% for and 33.3% against for the extraordinary ordinary resolution. I will now turn to the result of the vote. First resolution, the purpose of the first resolution is to approve the annual accounts for fiscal year 2020, showing a net loss of 138,815,198 euros, 80 cents. I remind you that these are the results of Renault SA and not the consolidated results of Group Renault. The uh, resolution uh, got 91.79% of favorable votes. It is adopted. The purpose of the second resolution is to approve the consolidated accounts for fiscal uh, year 2020, showing a net loss of 8,045,714,699 euros and six cents. Uh, the resolution received 90.83% uh, uh, of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The third resolution relates to the allocation of the income for the year 2020. It was existed to allocate the uh, loss for the year into the retained or carried over item. The, uh, resu the resolution received 99.82% uh, of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The fourth resolution suggests that you should take note of the statutory auditor's report on the elements used to determine the amount of remuneration for uh, redeemable shares. The resolution received 99.94% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The fifth resolution proposes to approve the report of the statutory auditors on related party agreements and commitments referred to in Articles 121, 38 of the French Code of Commerce, but no related party agreement was concluded in 2020. The resolution um, received 89.63% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The sixth resolution is the renewal on a proposal from Nissan of uh, the term of office of Mrs. Yul Serzara for a period of four years. The resolution received 98.94% uh, of favorable votes, 91% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. Seventh resolution is uh, considered the renewal on a proposal from the French government of the mandate of Mr. Thomas Courbe for a four-year period. The resolution received 98.04% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The eighth resolution concerns the renewal of the mandate of Mrs. Miriam Bensala Chakroun as director for a period of four years. The resolution received 67.27% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The ninth resolution concerns the renewal of the term of office of Mrs. Marie Annick Darmayak for a period of four years. The res uh, resolution received 91.04% of votes in favor. It is therefore adopted. Tenth resolution proposes that you appoint Mr. Bernard Delpit as a director for a period of four years. The resolution received 90.47% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The eleventh resolution proposes that you appoint Mr. Frédéric Mazella as director for a period of four years. The resolution received 90.66% of votes in favor. It is therefore adopted. 
The purpose of the 12th resolution is to appoint Mr. Noel Degrip as director representing employee shareholders for a period of four years. The resolution received 90.42% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The 13th resolution submits for your approval the information relating to the compensation for the year 2020 of the corporate officers. The resolu resolution received 90.39% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The 14th resolution submits for your approval the elements of compensation paid during or awarded for the year 2020 uh, to Mr. Jean-Dominique Sénard as chairman of the board of directors. The resolution received 91.50% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The 15th resolution submits for your approval the elements of compensation paid during or awarded for fiscal year 2020 for, to Mr. Luca Di Meo as chief executive officer. The resolution received 89.98% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The 16th resolution submits for your approval the elements of compensation paid during or granted for the, 20, for the year 2020 to Mrs. Clotilde Delbos. Uh, by virtue of mandate as interim CEO, the resolution received 19.04% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The purpose of the 17th resolution is to approve the compensation policy for the chairman of the board of directors for the year 2021. The resolution received 91.62% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The, the purpose of the 18th resolution is to approve the compensation policy for the chief executive officer for the year 2021. The resolution received 89.01% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The 19th resolution proposes that you approve the, the compensation policy for directors for the year 2021. The resolution received 91.69% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The purpose of the 20th resolution is to authorize the board of directors to trade in the company's shares for a maximum period of 18 months and within the limit of 10% of the share capital. This is the authorization that allows the company to implement its own uh, annual uh, share buyback program. The resolution received 90.33% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. The 21st resolution, which is an extraordinary resolution, aims to authorize the board of directors to reduce the company's capital by canceling treasury shares for a maximum period of 18 months and within the limit of 10% of the capital. The resolution is linked to the previous one on the share buyback program. The resolution received 91.17% of favorable votes. It is therefore adopted. Finally, the 22nd resolution aims to give the necessary powers to complete the legal formalities following this meeting. The resolution received 91.96% of votes in favor. Therefore, favor. <laughs> it is therefore adopted. Uh, all the resolutions on the agenda of the general meeting were therefore voted in favor. The uh, detailed results of the votes will be posted on the company's website, and I'll give the floor back to the Chairman of the Board to close this AGM. Well, thank you, Kitri. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear shareholders, I believe that the um, AGM has come to an end. I would like to uh, uh, congratulate uh, all the directors whose terms uh, were renewed, and I should also like to congratulate the new uh, comers who are joining the Board today. A big thank you to all of you. And uh, needless to say, uh, I look forward to seeing you again next year for the next AGM. Uh, well, that's uh, a long time from now, but we'll see. In any case, thank you to all. Goodbye. <laughs>